Introduction. The object of this study is the condition of knowledge in the most highly developed societies. I have decided to use the word postmodern to describe that condition. The word is in current use on the American continent among sociologists and critics. It designates the state of our culture following the transformations which, since the end of the 19th century, have altered the game rules for science, literature and the arts. The present study will place these transformations in the context of the crisis of narratives. Science has always been in conflict with narratives. Judged by the yardstick of science, the majority of them prove to be fables, but to the extent that science does not restrict itself to stating useful regularities and seeks the truth, it is obliged to legitimate the rules of its own game. It then produces a discourse of legitimation with respect to, a, to its own status, a discourse called philosophy. I will use the term modern to designate any science that legitimates itself with reference to a meta discourse of this kind, making ex an explicit appeal to some grand narrative, such as the dialectics of spirit, the hermeneutics of meaning, the emancipation of the rational or working subject, or the creation of wealth. For example, the rule of consensus between the sender and addressee of a statement with true value is deemed acceptable if it is cast in terms of a possible unanimity between rational minds. This is the Enlightenment narrative in which the hero of knowledge works towards a good ethico-political end, universal peace, as can be seen from this example. If a meta-narrative implying a philosophy of history is used to legitimate knowledge, questions are raised concerning the validity of the institutions governing the social bonds. These must be legitimated as well, thus justice is consigned to the grand narrative in the same way as truth. Simplifying to the extreme, I define postmodern as incredulity toward meta-narratives. This incredulity is undoubtedly a product of progress in the sciences, but that product Progress, in turn, presupposes it to the obsolescence of the meta-narrative apparatus of legitimation corresponds, most notably, the crisis of metaphysical philosophy and of the university institution which in the past relied on it. The narrative function is losing its functors, its great hero, its great dangers, its great voyages, its great goal. It is being dispersed in clouds of narrative language elements narrative but also denotative, prescriptive, descriptive, and so on, conveyed within each cloud are pragmatic valencies specific to its kind. Each of us lives at the intersection of many of these. However, we do not necessarily establish stable language combinations and the properties of the ones we do establish are not necessarily communicable. Thus the society of the future falls less within the province of a Newtonian anthropology, such as structuralism or systems theory, than the pragmatics of language particles. There are many different language games, a heterogeneity of elements. They only give rise to institutions in patches, local determinism. The decision makers, however, attempt to manage these clouds of sociality according to input-output matrices following a logic which implies that their elements are commensurable and that the whole is determinable. They allocate our lives for the growth of power in matters of social justice and of scientific truth alike. The legitimation of that power is based on its optimizing the system's performance, efficiency. The application of this criterion to all our games necessarily entails a certain level of terror, whether soft or hard, be operational, that is commensurable, or disappear. The logic of maximum performance is no doubt inconsistent in many ways, particularly with respect to the contradiction in the socio-economic fields. It demands both less work to lower production costs and more to lessen the social burden of the idle population. But our incredulity is now such that we no longer expect salvation to rise from these inconsistencies, as did Marx. 
Still, the postmodern condition is as much a stranger to disenchantment as it is to the blind positivity of delegitimization, where after the meta narratives can legitimacy reside. The operativity criterion is technological. It has no relevance for judging what is true or just. Its legitimacy to be found in incentives obtained through discussion, as Jurgen Haber Mass thinks, such consensus does violence to the heterogeneity of language games. An invention is always born of dissension. Postmodern knowledge is not simply a tool of the authorities, it refines our sensitivity to differences and reinforces our ability to tolerate the incommensurable. Its principle is not the expert's homology, but the inventor's paralogy. Here's the question. Is a legitimation of the social bonds a just society feasible in terms of a paradoxical, a paradox analogous to that of scientific activity? What would such a paradox be? The text that follows is an occasional one. It is a report on knowledge in the most highly developed societies and was presented to the Conseil des Universités of the Government of Quebec at the request of its president. I would like to thank him for his kindness in allowing its publication. It remains to be said that the author of the report is a philosopher, not an expert. The latter knows what he knows and what he does not know, the former does not. One concludes the other questions, two very different language games. I combine them here with the result that neither quite succeeds. The philosopher at least can console himself with the thought that the formal and pragmatic analysis of certain philosophical and ethico-political discourses of legitimation which underlies the report will subsequently see the light of day. The report will have served to introduce that analysis from a somewhat sociologizing slant, one that truncates but at the same time situates it. Such as it is, I dedicate this report to the Institut Polytechnique de Philosophie of the Université de Paris the Eighth, Vincennes, at this very postmodern moment that finds the university nearing what may be its end, while the Institut may, be, may just be beginning. One, the fields of knowledge in computerized societies. Our working hypothesis is that the status of knowledge is altered as societies enter what is known as the post-industrial age, and cultures enter what is known as the post-modern age. This transition has been underway since at least the end of the 1950s, which for Europe marks the completion of Reconstruction. The pace is faster or slower depending on the country, and within countries it varies according to the sector of activity. The general situation is one of temporal disjunction which makes sketching an overview difficult. A portion of the description would necessarily be conjectural. At any rate, we know that it is unwise to put too much faith in futurology. Rather than painting a picture that would inevitably remain incomplete, I will take as my point of departure a single feature, one that immediately defines our objects of study. Scientific knowledge is a kind of discourse, and it is fair to say that for the last 40 years, the leading sciences and technologies have had to do with language, phonology and theories of linguistics, problems of communication and cybernetics, modern theories of algebra and informatics, computers and their languages, problems of translation, and the search for areas of compatibility among computer languages, problems of information storage and data banks, telematics and the perfection of intelligent terminals, paradoxology, the facts speak for themselves, and this list is not exhaustive. These technological transformations can be expected to have a considerable impact on knowledge. Its two principal functions, research, and the transmission of acquired learning are already feeling the effect, or will in the future. With respect to the first function, GenX provides an example that is accessible to the layman. It owes its theoretical paradigm to cybernetics. Many other examples could be cited. 
As for the second function, it is common knowledge that the miniaturization and commercialization of machines is already changing the way in which learning is acquired, classified, made available, and exploited. It is reasonable to suppose that the proliferation of information processing machines is having, and will continue to have, as much of an effect on the circulation of learning as the advancements in human circulation, transportation systems, and later in the circulation of sounds and visual images, the media. The nature of knowledge cannot survive unchanged within this context of general transformation. It can fit into the new channels and become operational, only if learning is translated into quantities of information, we can predict that anything in the constituted body of knowledge that is not translatable in this way will be abandoned and that the direction of new research will be dictated by the possibility of its eventual results being translatable into computer language. The producers and users of knowledge must now, and will have to, possess the means of translating into these languages whatever they want to invent or learn. Research on translating machines is already well advanced. Along with the hegemony of computers comes a certain logic, and therefore a certain set of prescriptions determining which statements are accepted as knowledge statements. We may thus expect a thorough exteriorization of knowledge with respect to the owner, at whatever point he or she may occupy in the knowledge process, the old principle that the acquisition of knowledge is indissociable from the training of minds, or even of individuals, is becoming obsolete, and will become ever more so. The relationship of the suppliers and users of knowledge to the knowledge they supply and use is now tending, and will increasingly tend, to assume the form already taken by the relationship of commodity producers and consumers to the commodities they produce and consume, that is, a form of value, knowledge is and will be produced in order to be sold, it is and will be consumed in order to be valorized in a new production, in both cases the goal is exchange, knowledge ceases to be an end in itself, it loses its use value. It is widely accepted that knowledge has become the principal force of production over the last few decades. This has already had a noticeable effect on the composition of the workforce of the most highly developed countries and constitutes the major bottleneck for the developing countries. In the post-industrial and post-modern age, science will maintain a no doubt strength in its preeminence in the arsenal of productive capacities of the nation-states. Indeed, this situation is one of the reasons leading to the conclusion that the gap between developed and developing countries will grow ever wider in the future. But this aspect of the problem should not be allowed to overshadow the other, which is complementary to it. Knowledge in the form of an informational commodity, indispensable to productive power, is already, and will continue to be, a major, perhaps the major stake in the world's competition for power. It is, it is conceivable that the nation-states will one day fight for control of information, just as they battled in the past for control over territory, and afterwards for control of access to and exploitation of raw materials and cheap labour. A new field is open for industrial and commercial strategies on the one hand, and political and military strategies on the other. However, the perspective I have outlined above is not as simple as I have made it appear, for the mercantilization of knowledge is bound to affect the privilege of the nation-states have enjoyed, and still enjoy, with respect to the production and distribution of learning. The notion that learning falls within the purview of the state, as the brain or mind of society, will become more and more outdated with the increasing strength of the opposing principle according to which society exists and regresses only if the messages circulating within it are rich information and easy to decode. The ideology of communicational transparency, which goes hand in hand with the commercialization of knowledge, will begin to perceive the state as a factor of opacity and norms. It is from this point of view that the problem of the relationship 
between economic and state powers threatens to rise with a new urgency. Already in the last few decades, economic powers have reached the point of imperiling the stability of a state through new forms of the circulation of capital that go by the generic name of multinational corporations. These new forms of circulation imply that investment decisions have, at least in part, passed beyond the control of the nation-states. The question threatens to become even more thorny with the development of computer technology and telematics. Suppose, for example, that a firm, such as IBM, is authorized to occupy a belt in the Earth's orbital field and launch communications satellites or satellites housing data banks who will have access to them, who will determine which channels or data are forbidden. The state, or will the state simply be one user among others, new legal issues will be raised, and with them the question, who will know? Transformation in the nature of knowledge then could well have repercussions on the existing public powers, forcing them to reconsider their relations, both de jure and de facto, with the large corporations and more generally with civil society. The reopening of the world market, a return to vigorous economic competition, the breakdown of the hegemony of American capitalism, the decline of the social the socialist alternative, a probable opening of the Chinese market, these and many other factors are already, at the end of the 1970s, preparing states for a serious reappraisal of the role they have been accustomed to playing since the 1930s, that of guiding or even directing investments. In this light, the new technologies can only increase the urgency of such a re-examination since they make the information used in decision-making, and therefore the means of control, even more mobile and subject to piracy. It is not hard to visualize learning circulating along the same lines as money, instead of, for its educational value, or political, administrative, diplomatic, military importance. The pertinent si distinction would no longer be between knowledge and ignorance, but rather as is the case with money, between payment knowledge and investment knowledge. In other words, between units of knowledge exchanged in a daily maintenance framework, the reconstitution of the workforce survival, versus funds of knowledge dedicated to optimizing the performance of a project. If this were the case, communicational transparency would be similar to liberalism. Liberalism does not preclude an organization of the flow of money, in which some channels are used in decision-making, while others are only good for the payment of debts. One could similarly imagine flows of knowledge travelling along identical channels of identical nature, some of which would be reserved for the decision-makers, while the others would be used to repay each person's perpetual debt with respect to the social bond. Two, the problem, legitimation, that is the working hypothesis defining the fields within which I intend to consider the question of the status of knowledge. This scenario, akin to the one that goes by the name the computerization of society, although ours is advanced in an entirely different spirit, makes no claims of being original or even true. What is required of a working hypothesis is a buying capacity for discrimination. The scenario of the computerization of the most highly developed societies allows us to spotlight, though at the risk of excessive magnification, certain aspects of the transformation of knowledge and its effects on public power and civil institutions, effects it would be difficult to perceive from other points of view. Our hypothesis, therefore, should not be according accorded predictive value in relation to reality, strategic value in relation to the question raised. Nevertheless, it has strong credibility, and in that sense, our choice of this hypothesis is not arbitrary. It has been described extensively by the experts, and is already guiding certain decisions by the governmental agencies and private firms most directly concerned, such as those managing the telecommunications industry. To some extent, then, it is already a part of observable reality. Finally, 
barring economic stagnation or a general recession resulting, for example, from a continued failure to solve the world's energy problems, there is a good chance that this scenario will come to pass. It is hard to see what other direction contemporary technology could take as an alternative to the computerization of society. This is as much as to say that the hypothesis is banal, but only to the extent that it fails to challenge the general paradigm of progress in science and technology, to which economic growth and the expansion of socio-political power seem to be natural confluence. That scientific and technical knowledge is cumul cumulative is never questioned, and most, what is debated, is the form that accumulation takes. Some picture it as regular, continuous, and unanimous, others as periodic, discontinuous, and conflictual. But these truisms are fallacious. In the first place, scientific knowledge does not represent the totality of knowledge. It has always existed in addition to, and in competition in conflicts with, another kind of knowledge, which I will call narrative in the interests of simplicity. In its characteristics will be described later. I do not mean to say that narrative knowledge can prevail over science, but its model is related to ideas of internal equilibrium and conviviality next to what contemporary scientific knowledge cuts a poor figure, especially if it is to undergo an exteriorization with respect to the knower and an alienation from its user even greater than has previously been the case. The resulting demoralization of researchers and teachers is far from negligible. It is well known that during the 1960s, in all of the most highly developed societies, it reached such explosive dimensions among those preparing to practice these professions, students, that there was notable civil decrease in productivity as at laboratories and universities unable to protect themselves from its contamination. Expecting this, with hope or fear, to lead to a revolution, as was then often the case, is out of the question. It will not change the order of things in post-industrial society overnight. But this doubt in the part of scientists must be taken into account as a major factor in evaluating the present and future status of scientific knowledge. It is all the more necessary to take it into consideration since, and this is the second point, the scientists' demoralization has an impact on the central problem of legitimation. Of legitimation. I use the word in a broader sense than do contemporary German theorists in their discussions of the questions of authority. Take any civil law as an example. It states that a given category of citizens must perform a certain specific kind of action. Legitimation is the process by which a legislator is author authorized to promulgate such a law as a norm. Now take the example of a scientific statement. It is subject to the rule that a statement must fulfill a given set of conditions in order to be accepted as scientific. In this case, legitimation is the process by which a legislator dealing with scientific discourse is authorized to prescribe and the stated conditions, in general conditions of internal consistency and experimental verification, determining whether a statement is to be included in that discourse for consideration by the scientific community. The parallel may appear forced, but as we will see, it is not. The question of the legitimacy of science has been indissociably linked to that of the legitimation of the legislator since the time of Plato. From this point of view, the right to decide what is true is not independent of the right to decide what is just. Even if the statements consigned to these two authorities differ in nature, the point is that there is a strict interlinkage between the kinds of language called science and the kinds called ethics and politics that both stem from the same perspective, same choice, if you will, the choice called the Occident. Occident. When we examine the current status of scientific knowledge at a time when science seems more completely subordinated to the prevailing powers than ever before, 
and along with the new technologies, is in danger of becoming a major stake in their conflicts. The question of double legitimation, far from receding into the background, necessarily comes to the fore, for it appears in its most complete form that a reversion, revealing that knowledge and power are simply two sides of the same question, who decides what knowledge is and who knows what needs to be decided. In the computer age, the question of knowledge is now more than ever a question of government. 3. The method language games. The reader will already have noticed that in analysing this problem within the framework set forth, I have favoured a certain procedure, emphasising facts of language and in particular their pragmatic aspects. To help clarify what follows, it would be useful to summarise, however briefly, what is meant here by the term pragmatic. A denotative utterance, such as, the university is sick, made in the context of a conversation of an interview, positions its sender, the person who utters the statement, its addressee, the person who receives it, and its referent, what the statement deals with in a specific way. The utterance places and exposes the sender in the position of of nowhere, he knows what the situation is with the university. The addressee has put in the position of having to give or refuse his assent, and the referent itself is hands in a way unique to denotatives, as something that demands to be correctly identified and expressed by the statement that refers to it. If we consider a declaration such as, the university is open, pronounced by a dean or rector at convocation, it is clear that the previous specifications no longer apply. Of course, the meaning of the utterance has to be understood, but that is a general condition of communication and does not aid us in disting distinguishing the different kinds of utterances or their specific effects. The distinctive feature of the second Performative utterance is that its effect upon the referent coincides with its enunciation. The university is open because it has been declared open in the above mentioned circumstances. That this is so is not subject to discussion or verification on the part of the addressee, who is immediately placed within the new context created by the utterance. As for the sender, he must be invested with the authority to make such a statement. Actually, we could say it's the other way around. The sender is dean or rector, that is, he is invested with the authority to make this kind of statement only insofar as he can directly affect both the referent, the university, and address the, the university staff in the manner I have indicated. A different case involves utterances of the type, give money to the university, these are prescriptions. They can be modulated as orders, commands, instructions, recommendations, requests, prayers, pleas, etc. Here, the sender is clearly placed in a position of authority, using the term broadly, includes the authority of a sinner over a god who claims to be merciful. That is, he expects the addressee to perform the action referred to. The pragmatics of prescription entail concomitant changes in the posts of addressee and referent. Of a different order again is the efficacy of a question, a promise, a literary description, a narration, etc. I am summarising Wittgenstein, taking up the study of language again from scratch, focuses his attention on the effects of different modes of discourse. He calls the various types of utterances he identifies along the way, a few of which I have listed, language games. What he means by this term is that each of the various categories of utterance can be defined in terms of rules, specifying their properties and the uses to which they can be put. In exactly the same way as the game of chess is defined by a set of rules determining the properties of each of the pieces, in other way, words, the proper way to move them. It is useful to make the following three observations about language games. The first is that their rules do not carry with them, within themselves their own legitimation, but are the object of a contract, explicit or not, between players, which is not to say that the players invent the rules. 
The second is that if there are no rules, there is no game. That even an infinitesimal modification of one rule alters the nature of the game. That a move or utterance that does not satisfy the rules does not belong to the game they define. The third remark is addressed by what has just been said. Every utterance should be thought of as a move in a game. This last observation brings us to the first principle underlying our method as a whole. To speak is to fight in the sense of playing and speech acts falls within the domain of a general ag ag agonistics. This does not necessarily mean that one plays in order to win. A move can be made for the sheer pleasure of its invention. What else is involved in the labour of language harassment undertaken by popular speech and by literature? Great joy is had in the endless invention of turns of phrase, of words and meanings, the process behind the evolution of language on the level of parole. But undoubtedly, even this pleasure depends on a feeling of, of success won at the expense of an adversary, at least one adversary, and a formidable one, the accepted language or connotation. The idea of an agonistics of language should not make us lose sight of the second principle, which stands as a complement to it and governs our analysis, that the observable social bond is composed of language moves. An elucidation of this proposition will take us to the heart of the matter at hand. 4. The nature of the social bond, the modern alternative. If we wish to discuss knowledge in the most highly developed contemporary society, we must answer the preliminary question of what methodological representation to apply to that society. Simplifying to the extreme, it is fair to say that in principle, there have been, at least over the ha last half century, two basic representational models for society. Either the society forms a functional whole, or it is divided in two. An illustration of the first model is suggested by Talcott Parsons, at least the post-war Parsons, at a school, and the second by the Marxist current. All of its component schools, whatever differences they may have, accept both the principle of class struggle and dialectics as a duality operating within society. This methodological split, which defines two major kinds of discourse on society, has been handed down from the 19th century the idea that society forms an organic whole, in the absence of which it ceases to be a society, and sociology ceases to have an object of study, dominates the minds of the founders of the French school. Added detail was applied by functionalism. It took yet another turn in the 1950s, with Parsons' conception of society as a self-regulating system. The theoretical and even material model is no longer the living organism it is provided by cybernetics, which, during and after the Second World War, expanded the model's applications. In Parsons' work, the principle behind the system is still, if I may say so, to mystic. It corresponds to the stabilization of the growth economies and societies of abundance under the aegis of a moderate welfare state. In the work of contemporary German theorists, system theory is technocratic, even cynical, not to mention despairing, the harmony between the needs and hopes of individuals or groups and the functions guaranteed by the system is now only a secondary component of its functioning. The true goal of the system, the reason it programs itself like a computer, is the optimization of the global relationship between input and output. In other words, informativity. Even when its rules are in the process of changing and innovations are occurring, even when its dysfunctions, such as strikes, crises, unemployment, or political revolutions, inspire hope and lead to belief in an alternative, even then, what is actually taking place is only an internal readjustment, and its result can be no more than an increase in the system's viability. The only alternative to this kind of performance improvement is entropy, or decline. Here again, while avoiding the simplifications inherent in a sociology of social theory, 
it is difficult to deny at least a parallel between this hard, technocratic version of society and the ascetic effort that was demanded. The fact that it was done in a of advanced liberalism is beside the point of the most highly developed industrial societies in order to make them competitive and thus optimize their rationality within the framework of the resumption of the economic world war in the 1960s. Even taking into account the massive displacement intervening between the thoughts of a man like Comte and the thoughts of Lou Man, we can discern a common conception of the social. Society is a unified totality, a unicity. Parsons formulates this clearly. The most essential condition of successful dynamic analysis is a continual and systematic reference of every problem to the state of the system as a whole. A process or set of conditions either contributes to the maintenance or development of the system or it is dysfunctional in that it detracts from the integration, effectiveness, etc. of the system. The technocrats also subscribe to this idea. When it's credibility, it has the means to become a reality, and that is all the proof it needs. This is what Horkheimer called the paranoia of reason. But this realism of systemic self-regulation and its perfectly sealed circle of facts and interpretations can be judged paranoid only if one has, or claims to have, at one's disposal a viewpoint that is in principle immune from their allure. This is the function of the principle of class struggle in society, theories of society based on the work of Marx. Traditional theory is always in danger of being incorporated into the programming of the social whole as a simple tool for the optimization of its performance. This is because it's desirable for a unitary and totalizing truth lends itself to the unitary and totalizing practice of the system's managers. Critical theory, based on a principle of dualism and wary of syntheses and re reconciliations, should be in a position to avoid this fate. What guides Marxism, then, is a different model of society and a different conception of the function of the knowledge that can be produced by society and acquired from it. This model was born of the struggles accompanying, accompanying the process of capitalism's encroach, encroachment upon traditional civil societies. There is sufficient space here. There is insufficient space here to chart the vicissitudes of these struggles, which fill more than a century of social, political, and ideological history. We will have to content ourselves with a glance at the balance sheet, which is possible for us to tally today now that their fate is known. In countries with liberal or advanced liberal management, the struggles and their instruments have been transformed into regulators of the system. In communist countries, the totalizing model and its totalitarian effects have made a comeback. In the name of Marxism itself, and the struggles in question have simply been deprived of the right to exist. Everywhere, the critique of political economy, the subtitle of Marx's capital, and its correlate, the critique of alienated society, are used in one way or another as aids in programming the system. Of course, certain minorities, such as the Frankfurt School or the group Socialisme or Barberi, preserved and refined the critical model in opposition to this process, but the social foundation of the principle of division or class struggle was blurred to the point of losing all of its radicality. We cannot conceal the fact that the critical model in the end lost its theoretical standing and was reduced to the status of a utopia or a hope, a token protest raised in the name of man or reason or creativity are again of some social category, such as the third world or the students, on which is conferred, in extremis, the henceforth improbable function of critical subjects. The sole purpose of this schematic or skeletal reminder has been to specify the problematic in which I intend to frame the question of knowledge in advanced industrial societies, 
for it is impossible to know what the state of knowledge is. In other words, the problems its development and distribution are facing today without knowing something of the, of the society within which it is situated. And today, more than ever, knowing about that society involves, first of all, choosing what approach the inquiry will take, and that necessarily means choosing how society can answer. One can decide that the principal role of knowledge is as an indispensable element in the functioning of society, and act in accordance with that decision, only if one has already decided that society is a giant machine. Conversely, one can count on its critical function and orient its development and distribution in that direction, only after it has been decided that society does not form an integrated whole, but remains haunted by a principle of opposition. The alternative seems clear. It is a choice between the homogeneity and the intrinsic duality of the social, between functional and critical knowledge, but the decision seems difficult or arbitrary. It is tempting to avoid the decision altogether by distinguishing two kinds of knowledge. One, the positivist kinds, would be directly applicable to technologies bearing on men and materials, and would lend itself to operating as an indispensable productive force within the system. The other, the critical, reflexive or hermeneutic kinds, or reflecting directly or indirectly on values or aims, would resist any such recuperation. 5. The nature of the social bond, the postmodern perspective. I find this partition solution unacceptable. I suggest that the alternative it attempts to resolve, but only reproduces, is no longer relevant for the societies with which we are concerned, and that the solution itself is still caught within a type of oppositional thinking that is out of step with the most vital modes of postmodern knowledge. As I have already said, economic redeployment in the current phase of capitalism, aided by a shift in techniques and technology, goes hand in hand with a change in the function of the state. The image of society, the syndrome, suggests necessitates a serious revision of the alternate approaches considered. For brevity's sake, suffice it to say that functions of regulation, and therefore of reproduction, are being and will be further withdrawn from administrators and entrusted to machines. Increasingly, the question is becoming who will have access to the information these machines must have in storage to guarantee that the right decisions are made. Access to data is and will continue to be the prerogative of experts of all stripes. The ruling class is and will continue to be the class of decision makers. Even now, it is no longer composed of the traditional political class, but of a composite layer of corporate leaders, high-level administrators, and the heads of the major professional, labor, political, and religious organizations. What is new in all of this is that the old poles of attraction, represented by nation-states, parties, professions, institutions, and historical traditions are losing their attraction, and it does not look as though they will re be replaced, at least not on their form or scale. The Trilateral Commission is not a popular pole of attraction. Identifying with the great names, the heroes of contemporary history is becoming more and more difficult. Dedicating oneself to catching up with Germany, the life goal, the French president, Giscard d'Estaing, at the time the book was published in France, seems to be offering his countrymen is not exactly exciting. But then again, it is not exactly a life goal. It depends on each individual's industriousness. Each individual is referred to himself, and each of us knows that our self does not amount to much. This breaking up of the grand narratives discussed below, sections 9 and 10, leads to what some authors analyse in terms of the dissolution of the social bond and the disintegration of social aggregates 
into a mass of individual atoms thrown into the absurdity of Bronian motion. Nothing of the kind is happening. This point of view, it seems to me, is haunted by the paradisaic representation of a lost, organic society. A self does not amount to much, but no self is an island. Each exists in a fabric of relations that is now more complex and mobile than ever before. Young or old, man or woman, rich or poor, a person is always located at nodal points of specific communication circuits, however tiny these may be. Or better, one is always located at a post through which various kinds of messages pass. No one, not even the least privileged among us, is ever entirely powerless over the messages that traverse and position him at the post of sender, addressee, or reference. One's mobility in relation to these language game effects, language games, of course, are what this is all about, is tolerable, tolerable, at least within certain limits, and the limits are vague. It is even solicited by regulatory mechanisms, and in particular by the sub-adjustments the system undertakes in order to improve its performance. It may even be said that the system can and must encourage such movement to the extent that it combats its own entropy. The novelty of an unexpected move, with its correlative displacement of a partner or a group of partners, can supply the system with that increased performativity it forever demands and consumes. It should now be clear from which perspective I choose language games as my general methodological approach. I am not claiming that the entirety of social relations is of this nature. That will remain an open question. But there is no need to resort to some fiction of social origins to establish that language games are the minimum relation required for society to exist, even before he is born, if only by virtue of the name he is given. The human child is already positioned as the reference in the story recounted by those around him, in relation to which he will inevitably chart his course. Or more simply still, the question of the social bonds, insofar as it is a question, is itself a language game, the game of inquiry. It immediately positions the person who asks, as well as the addressee and the referent asks about. It is already the social bonds. On the other hand, in a society whose communication component is becoming more prominent day by day, both as a reality and as an issue, it is clear that language assumes a new importance. It would be superficial to reduce its significance to the traditional alternative between manipulatory speech and the unilateral transmission of messages on the one hand and free expression and dialogue on the other. A word on this last point. If the problem is described simply in terms of communication theory, two things are overlooked. First, messages of quite different forms and effects depending on whether they are, for example, denotatives, prescriptives, evaluatives, performatives, etc. It's clear but what is important is not simply the fact that they communicate information. Reducing them to this function is to adopt an outlook which unduly privileges the system's own interests and point of view. A cybernetic machine does indeed run on information, but the goals programmed into it, for example, originate in prescriptive and evaluative statements it has no way to correct in the course of its functioning. For example, maximizing its own performance. How can one guarantee that performance maximization is the best goal for the social system in every case? In any case, the atoms forming its matter are competent to handle statements such as these, and this question in particular. Second, the trivial cybernetic version of information theory misses something of decisive importance to which I have already called attention. The agonistic aspect of society, the atoms are placed at the crossroads of pragmatic relationships, but they are also displaced by the messages that traverse them in perpetual motion. Each language partner, when a move pertaining to him is made, is made undergoes a displacement, an alteration of some kind that not only affects him in his capacity as a dressee and referent, but also as a sender. These moves necessarily provoke counter-moves and 
everyone knows that a counter move that is merely reactional is not a good move. Reactional counter moves are no more than programmed effects in the opponent's strategy. They play into his hands and thus have no effects on the balance of power. That is why it is important to increase displacement in the games and even disorient it in such a way as to make an unexpected move a new statement. What is needed if we are to understand social relations in this manner, on whatever scale we choose, is not only a theory of communication, but a theory of games which accepts agonistics as a founding principle. In this context, it is easy to see that the essential element of newness is not simply innovation. Support for this approach can be found in the work of a number of contemporary sociologists, in addition to linguists, linguists and philosophers of language. This atomization of the social into flexible networks of language games may seem far removed from the modern reality, which is depicted depicted, on the contrary as afflicted with bureaucratic paralysis. The objection will be made at least that the weight of certain institutions imposes limits on the games and thus restricts the inventiveness of the players in making their moves, but I think this can be taken into account without causing any particular difficulty. In the ordinary use of discourse, for example, in a discussion between two friends, interlocutors use any available ammunition, changing games from one utterance to the next, questions, requests, assertions and narratives are launched pell-mell into battle. The war is not without rules, but the rules allow and encourage the greatest possible flexibility of utterance. From this point of view, an institution differs from a conversation in that it is all in that it always requires supplementary constraints for statements to be declared admissible within its bounds. The constraints function to filter discursive potentials, interrupting possible connections in the communication networks that are things that should not be said. They also privilege certain classes of statements, sometimes only one whose predominance characterizes the discourse of the particular institution. There are things that should be said and there are ways of saying them, thus orders in the army, prayer in church, denotation in the schools, narration in families, questions in philosophy, performativity in businesses, bureaucratization is the outer limits of this tendency. However, this hypothesis about the institution is still too unwieldy, its point of departure is an overly reifying view of what is institutionalized, we know today that the limits the institution imposes on potential language moves are never established, once and for all, even if they have been formally defined. Rather, the limits are themselves the stakes and provisional results of language strategies within the institution and without examples. Does the university have a place for language experiments? Poetics. Can you tell stories in a cabinet meeting? advocate a cause in the barracks? The answers are clear, yes. If the university opens creative workshops, yes. If the cabinet works with prospective scenarios, yes. If the limits of the old institution are displaced. Specifically, it can be said that the boundaries only stabilize when they cease to be stakes in the game. This, I think, is the appropriate approach to contemporary institutions of knowledge. 6. The Pragmatics of Narrative Knowledge Section 1. I level two objections against the unquestioning acceptance of an instrumental conception of knowledge in the most highly developed societies. Knowledge is not the same as science, especially in its contemporary form. Science far from successfully obscuring the problem of its legitimacy, cannot avoid raising it with all of its implications, which are no less sociopolitical than epistemological. Let us begin with an analysis of the nature of narrative. Knowledge, by providing a point of comparison, our examination will clarify at least some 
of the characteristics of the form assumed by scientific knowledge in contemporary society. In addition, it will aid us in understanding how the question of legitimacy is raised or fails to be raised today. Knowledge in general cannot be reduced to science, nor even to learning. Learning is the set of statements which, to the exclusion of all other statements, denote or describe objects, and may be declared true or false. Science is a subset of learning. It is also composed of denotative statements, but imposes two supplementary conditions on their acceptability. The objects to which they refer must be av available for repeated access. In other words, they must be accessible in explicit conditions of observation, and it must be possible to decide whether or not a given statement pertains to the language judged relevant by the experts. But what is meant by the term knowledge is not only a set of denotative statements, far from it. It also in includes notions of know-how, knowing how to live, how to listen, etc. Knowledge, then, is a question of competence that goes beyond the simple determination and application of the criterion of truth, extending to the determination and application of criteria of efficiency, technical qualification, of justice, and of happiness, ethical wisdom, of the beauty of a sound or colour, auditory and visual sensibility, etc. Understood in this way, knowledge is what makes someone capable of forming good denotative utterances, but also good prescriptive and good evaluative utterances. It is not a, comp it is not a competence relative to a particular class of statements, for example cognitive ones, the, to the exclusion of all others. On the contrary, it makes good performances in relation to a variety of objects of discourse possible, objects to be known, decided on, evaluated, transformed. From this derives one of the principal features of knowledge. It coincides with an extensive array of competence-building measures as the only form embodied in a subject constituted by the various areas of competence composing it. Another characteristic merits and special attention is the relation between this kind of knowledge and custom. What is a good prescriptive or evaluative utterance, a good performance in denotative or technical matters? They were all judged to be good because they conform to the relevant criteria of justice, beauty, truth, and efficiency respectively, accepted in the social circle of the Noah's interlocutors. The early philosophers called this mode of legitimating statements opinion. The consensus that permits such knowledge to be circumscribed and makes it possible to distinguish one who knows from one who doesn't, the foreigner, the child, is what constitutes the culture of a people. The brief reminder of what knowledge can be in the way of training and culture draws on ethnolo ethnological description for its justification, but anthropological studies and literature that takes rapidly developing societies as their objects can attest to the survival of this type of knowledge within them, at least in some of their sectors. The very idea of development presupposes a horizon of non-development of non development where, it is assumed, the various areas of competence remain enveloped in the unity of a tradition and are not differentiated according to separate qualifications subject to spe specific innovations, debates, and inquiries, this opposition does not necessarily meet, imply a difference in nature between primitive and civilized man, but is compatible with the premise of a formal identity between the savage mind and scientific thought. It is even compatible with the apparently contrary premise of the superiority of customary knowledge over the contemporary dispersion of competence. It is fair to say that there is one point on which all of the investigations agree, regardless of which scenario they propose to dramatise and understand the distance separating the customary state of knowledge from its state of the scientific age, the preeminence of the narrative form in the formulation of traditional language knowledge. Some study this form for its own sake. 
others see it as diachronic costume of the structural operators that, according to them, properly constitute the knowledge in question. Still others bring to it an economic interpretation in the Freudian sense of the term. All that is important here is the fact that its form is narrative. Narration is the quintessential form of customary language in more ways than one. First, the popular stories themselves recount what could be called positive or negative apprenticeships. In other words, the successes or failures greeting the hero's undertakings. These successes or failures either bestow legitimacy upon social institutions, the function of myths, or represent positive or negative models, the successful or unsuccessful hero of integration into established institutions, legends, and tales. Thus, the narratives allow the society in which they are told, on the one hand, to define its criteria of competence, and on the other, to evaluate according to those criteria that is performed or can be performed within it. Second, the narrative form, unlike the developed forms of the discourse of language, uh, discourse of knowledge, lends itself to a greater variety of language games. Denotative statements concerning, for example, the state of the sky and the flora and fauna easily slip in. So do deontic statements prescribing what should be done with respect to these same reference or with respect to kinship. The difference between the sexes, children, neighbours, foreigners, etc. Interrogative statements are implied, for example, in episodes involving challenges, respond to a question, choose one from a number of things, evaluative statements, also answer in, etc. The areas of competence whose criteria the narrative supplies, replies, are thus tightly woven together in the web it forms ordered by the unified viewpoint characteristic of this kind of knowledge. We shall examine in somewhat more detail a third property, which relates to the transmission of narratives. Their narration usually obeys rules that define the pragmatics of their transmission. I do not mean to say that a given society institutionally assigns the role of narrator to certain categories on the basis of age, sex, or family, or professional group. What I am getting at is a pragmatics of popular narratives that is, so to speak, intrinsic to them. For example, a Kashinahua storyteller always begins his narration with a fixed formula. Here is the story of, as I've already heard it told, I will tell it to you in my turn, listen. And he brings it to a close with another, also in variables formula. Here ends the story of, the man who has told it to you is Kashino Hua name, or to the whites, Spanish or Portuguese name. A quick analysis of this double pragmatic instruction reveals the following. The narrator's only claim to competence for telling the story is the fact that he has heard it himself. The current narratee gains potential access to the same authority simply by listening. It is claimed that the narrative is a faithful transmission, even if the narrative performance is highly inventive, and that it has been told forever. Therefore, the hero, Akashina Huen, was himself once a narrator, and perhaps a narrator of the very same story. This similarity of condition allows for the possibility that the current narrator could be the hero of a narrative, just as the ancestor was. In fact, he is necessarily such a hero because he bears a name, declined to the end of his narration. That name was given to him in conformity with the canonic narrative legitimating the assignments of patronyms among the Kashinahua. The pragmatic rule ir illustrated by this example cannot, of course, be universalized. but it gives insight into what is a generally recognised property of traditional knowledge. The narrative posts, sender, addressee, hero, 
are so organized that the right to occupy the post of sender receives the following double grounding. It is based upon the facts of having occupied the post of addressee and of having been recounted oneself by virtue of the name one bears by a previous narrative, in other words, having been positioned as the diegetic reference of other narrative events. The knowledge transmitted by these narrations is in no way limited to the functions of enunciation. It determines, in a single stroke, what one must say in order to be heard what one must listen to in order to speak, and what role one must play on the scene of diegetic reality to be the no object of a narrative speech. Uh, to be the object of a narrative. Thus, the speech acts relevant to this form of knowledge are formed not only by the speaker, but also by the listener, as well as by the third party referred to, the knowledge arising from such an apparatus may seem condensed in comparison with what I call developed knowledge. Our example clearly illustrates that a narrative tradition is also the, the tradition of the criteria defining a threefold competence, know-how, knowing how to speak, and knowing how to hear, through which the community's relationship to itself and its environment is played out. What is transmitted through these narratives is the set of pragmatic rules that constitutes the social bond. A fourth aspect of narrative knowledge, meriting careful examination, is its effect on time. Narrative form follows a rhythm. It is the synthesis of a meter beating time in regular periods on an accent, modifying the length or amplitude of certain of those periods. This vibratory, musical property of narrative is clearly revealed in the ritual performance of certain Kashinahua tales. They are handed down in initiation ceremonies in absolutely fixed form, in a language whose meaning is obscured by lexical and syntactic anomalies, and they are sung as interminable, monotonous chants. It is a strange brand of knowledge, you may say, that does not even make itself understood to the young men to whom it is addressed. And yet this kind of knowledge is quite common. Nursery rhymes are of this type, and repetitive forms of con contemporary music have tried to recapture or at least approximate it. It exhibits a surprising feature, as metre takes precedence over accent in the production of sound, spoken or not. Time ceases to be a support for memory to become an immemorial beating that, in the absence of a noticeable separation between periods, prevents their being numbered and consigns them to oblivion. Consider the form of popular sayings, proverbs and maxims. They are like little splinters of potential narratives or moulds of all ones which have continued to circulate on certain levels of the contemporary social edifice. In their prosody can be recognised the mark of that strange temporalization that jars the golden rule of our knowledge, never forget. Now, there must be a congruence between this lethal function of narrative knowledge and the functions cited earlier, and of criteria for mation, the unification of areas of competence and social regulation, by way of a simplifying fiction, we can hypothesize that, against all expectations, a collectivity that makes narrative as its key form of competence has no need to remember its past. It finds the raw material for its social bonds not only in the meaning of the narratives it recounts, but also in the act of reciting them. The narrative's reference may seem to belong to the past, but in reality, it is always contemporaneous with the acts of recitation, it is the present act that on each of its occurrences marshals in the ephemeral temporality inhabiting the space between the I have heard and the you will hear. The important thing about the pragmatic protocol of this kind of narration is that it betokens a theoretical identity between each of the narrative's occurrences. This may not in fact be the case, and often is not 
and we should not blind ourselves to the elements of, the, of humor or anxiety noticeable in the respects this etiquette inspires. The fact remains that what is emphasized is the metrical beats of the narrative occurrences. Not each performance is different as an accent. It is in the sense that this mode of temporality can be said to be simultaneously evanescent and immemorial. Finally, a culture that gives precedence to the narrative form doubtless has no more of a need for special procedures to authorize its narratives than it has to remember its past. It is hard to imagine such a culture first isolating the post of narrator from the others in order to give it a privileged status in narrative pragmatics, then inquiring into what right the narrator, which is thus disconnected from the narrati and diegesis, might have to recount what he recounts. And finally, undertaking the analysis or am anamnesis of its own legitimacy. It is even harder to imagine it handing over the authority for its narratives to some incomprehensible subject of narration. The narratives themselves have this authority. In a sense, the people are only that which actualizes the narratives. Once again, they do this not only by recounting them, but also by listening to them and recounting themselves through them. In other words, by putting them into play in their institutions, thus by assigning themselves the posts of narrati and diegesis, as well as the post of narrator. There is, then, an incommensurability between popular narrative pragmatics, which provides immediate legitimation, and the language game known to the West as the question of legitimacy, or rather, legitimacy as a reference in the game of inquiry, Narratives, as we have seen, determine criteria of competence and or illustrate how they are to be applied. They thus define what has the right to be said and done in the culture in question. And since they are themselves a part of that culture, they are legitimated by the simple fact that they do what they do. Seven, the pragmatics of scientific knowledge. That is a time to characterize, if only in summary fashion, the classical conception of the pragmatics of scientific knowledge. In the process, we will distinguish between the research game and the teaching game. Copernicus states that the path of the planet is circular. Whether this proposition is true or false, it carries within it a set of tensions, all of which affect each of the pragmatic posts it brings into play, sender, addressee, and reference. The tensions are classes of prescriptions which regulate the admissibility of the statement as scientific. First, the sender should speak the truth about the reference, the path, the planets. What does this mean? That, on the other hand, he's supposed to be able to provide proof of what he says, and on the other hand, he's supposed to be able to refute any opposing or contradictory statements concerning the same reference. Second, it should be possible for the addressee val validly to give or refuse his assent to the statement he hears. This implies that he is himself a potential sender, since when he formulates his agreement or disagreement, he will be subject to the same double requirement or proof of refutation, proof or refutation that Copernicus was. He is therefore supposed to have potentially the same qualities as Copernicus, he is his equal. But this will only become known when he speaks and under the above conditions. Before that, it will be impossible to say whether or not he is a scientific scholar. <clears throat> Third, the referent, the path of the planets of which Copernicus speaks, is supposed to be expressed by his statements in conformity with what it actually is. But since what is, it is can only be known through statements of the same order as that of Copernicus, the role of adequation becomes problematical. What I say is true, because I prove that it is, but what proof is there that my proof is true? The scientific solution of this difficulty consists in the observance of two rules. 
The first of these is dialectical, or even rhetorical, in the forensic sense. A reference is that which is suspect susceptible to proof and can be used as evidence in a debate. Not, I can prove something because reality is the way I say it is. But, as long as I can produce proof, it is permissible to think that reality is the way I say it is. The second rule is metaphysical. The same referent cannot supply a plurality of contradictory or inconsistent proofs, or stated differently, God is not deceptive. These two rules underlie what 19th century science calls verification and 20th century science falsification. They allow a horizon of consensus to be brought to the debate between partners, the sender and the addressee. Not every consensus is a sign of truth, but it's presumed that the truth of a statement necessarily draws a consensus. That covers research. It should be evident that research appeals to teaching as its necessary complement. The scientist's needs an addressee who can in turn become the sender. He needs a partner. Otherwise, the verification of his statements would be impossible since the non-renewal of the requisite skills would eventually bring an end to the necessary contradictory debate. Not only the truth of a scientist's statement, but also his competence, is at stake in that debate. One's competence is never an accomplished fact. It depends on whether or not the statement proposed is considered by one's peers to be worth discussion in a sequence of argumentation and refutation. The truth of the statement and the competence of its sender are thus subject to the collective approval of a group of persons who are competent on the, an equal basis. Equals are needed and must be created. Didactics is what assures that this reproduction takes place. It is different from the dialectical game of research. Brief briefly, its first presupposition is that the addressee, the student, does not know what the sender knows. Obviously, that is why he has something to learn. Its second presupposition is that the student can learn what the sender knows and becomes an expert whose competence is equal to that of his master. This double requirement supposes a third, that there are statements for which the exchange of arguments and the production of proof constituting the pragmatics of research are considered to have been sufficient, which can therefore be transmitted through teaching as they stand, in the guise of indisputable truths. In other words, you teach what you know, such as the expert, but as the student, the addressee of the didactic process improves his skills, the expert can confide to him what he does not know, but is trying to learn, at least if the expert is also involved in research. In this way, the student is introduced to the dialectics of research or the game of producing scientific knowledge. If we compare the pragmatics of science to that of narrative knowledge, we note the following properties. Knowledge, scientific knowledge requires that one language game, denotation, be retained and all others excluded. A statement's truth value is the criterion determining its acceptability. Of course, we find other classes of statements, such as interrogatives, how can we explain that, and prescriptives, take a finite series of elements, but they are only present as turning points in the dialectical argumentation, which must end in a denotative statement. In this context, then, one is learned if one can produce a true statement about a reference, and one is a scientist if one can produce verifiable or falsifiable statements about reference accessible to the experts. Scientific knowledge is in this way set apart from the language games that combine to form the social bonds. Unlike narrative knowledge, it is no longer a direct and shared component of the bonds, but it's indirectly a component of it because it develops into a profession and gives rise to institutions, and in modern societies, language games consolidate themselves in the form of institutions run by qualified partners, the professional class. 
the relation between knowledge and society, that is the sum total of partners in the general agonistics excluding the scientists in their professional capacity, becomes one of mutual exteriority. A new problem appears, that of the relationship between the scientific institution and society. Can this problem be solved by didactics, for example, by the premise that any social atom can acquire scientific competence? Within the bounds of the game of research, the competence required concerns the post of sender alone. There is no particular competence required of the addressee. It is required only in didactics that the student must be intelligent. And there is no competence required of the referent, even in the case of the human scientists, science, even in the case of the human sciences, where it is an aspect of human conduct, the referent is in principle external to the partners engaged in scientific dialectics. Here in contrast to the narrative game, a person does not have to know how to be what knowledge says he is. A statement of science gains no validity in, from the facts of being reported. Even in the case of pedagogy, it is taught only if it is still verifiable in the present through argumentation and proof. In itself, it is never secure from falsification. The knowledge that has accumulated in the form of already accepted statements can always be challenged. But conversely, any new statement that contradicts a previously approved statement regarding the same referent can be accepted as valid only if it refutes the previous statement by reducing arguments and proofs. The game of science thus implies a diachronic temporality that is a memory and a project. The current sender of a scientific statement is supposed to be acquainted with previous statements concerning its reference, bibliography, and only proposes a new statement on the subjects if it differs from the previous ones. Here, what I have called the accent of each performance, and by that token the polemical function of the game, takes precedence over the meter. This diachrony, which assumes memory as a search for the new, represents in principle a communal native process, its rhythm, or the relationship between accents and meter, is variable. These properties are well known, but they are worth recalling for two reasons. First, drawing a parallel between science and non-scientific narrative knowledge helps us understand, or at least sense, that the former's existence is no more, and no less necessary, than the latter's. Both are composed of sets of statements. The statements are moves made by the players within the framework of generally applicable rules. These rules are specific to each particular kind of knowledge, and the moves judged to be good in one cannot of the same type as those judged good in another, unless it happens that way by chance. It is therefore impossible to judge the existence or validity of narrative knowledge on the basis of scientific knowledge, and vice versa. The relevant criteria are different. All we can do is gaze in wonderment at the diversity of discursive species, just as we do at the diversity of plant or animal species, lamenting the loss of meaning in most modern post-modernity boils down to mourning the fact that knowledge is no longer principally narrative, such a reaction does not necessarily follow, neither does it attempt to, to derive or engender, using operators like development, scientific knowledge from narrative knowledge, as if the former contained the latter in an environic state. Nevertheless, language species, like living species, are interrelated, and the relations are far from harmonious. The second point justifying this quick reminder on the properties of the language game of science concerns precisely its relation to narrative knowledge. I have said that narrative knowledge does not give priority to the question of its own legitimation and that it certifies itself in the pragmatics of its own transmission without having recourse to argumentation and proof. This is why its incomprehension of the problems of scientific discourse is accompanied by a certain tolerance it approaches such discourse primarily as a variant 
in the family of narrative cultures, the opposite is not true. The scientist questions the validity of narrative statements and concludes that they are never subject to argumentation or proof. He cla classifies them as belonging to a different mentality, savage, primitive, underdeveloped, backward, alienated, composed of opinions, customs, authority, prejudice, ignorance, ideology. Narratives are fables, myths, legends, fit only for women and children. At first, attempts. At best, attempts are made to throw some rays of light into this obscurantism to civilize, educate, develop. This unequal relationship is an intrinsic effect of the rules specific to each game. We all know its symptoms. It is the entire history of cultural imperialism from the dawn of Western civilization. It is important to recognize its special tenor, which sets it apart from all other forms of imperialism and is governed by the demand for legitimation. Eight, the narrative function and the legitimation of knowledge. Today, the problem of legitimation is no longer considered a failing of the language game of science. It would be more accurate to say that it has itself been legitimated as a problem, that is, as a heuristic driving force. But this way of dealing with it by reversing the situation is of recent date. Before it came to this point, what some call positivism, Scientific knowledge sought other solutions. It is remarkable that for a long time it could not help resorting for its solutions to, perceive, to procedures that, overtly or not, belong to narrative knowledge. This return of the narrative in the non-narrative, in one form or another, should not be thought of as having been superseded once and for all. A crude proof of this, what do scientists do when they appear on television or are interviewed in papers, after making a discovery, they recount an epic of knowledge that is in fact wholly unepic. They play by the rules of the narrative game. Its influence remains considerable only, uh, not only on the users of the media, but also on the scientists' sentiments. This fact is neither trivial nor accessory. It concerns the relationship of scientific knowledge to popular knowledge or what is left of it. State depends large amounts of the state. The, the state spends large amounts of money to enable science to pass itself off as an epic. The state's own credibility is based on that epic, which it uses to obtain the public consent its decision makers need. It is not conceivable that the recourse to narrative is inevitable, at least to the extent that the language game of science desires. It statements to be true, but does not have the resources to legitimate the truth on its own. If this is the case, it is necessary to admit an irreducible need for history understood, as outlined above, not as a need to remember or to project, a need for historicity, historicity for accent, but on the contrary, as a need to forget, a need for a metro. See section 6. We are anticipating ourselves. But as we proceed, we should keep in mind that the apparently obsolete solutions that have been found for the problem of legitimation are not obsolete in principle, but only in their expression. We should not be surprised if we find that they have persisted to this day in other forms. Do not we ourselves, at this moment, feel obliged to mount a narrative of scientific knowledge in the West in order to clarify its status? The new language game of science posed the problem of its own legitimation at the very beginning, in Plato. This is not the proper place for the anexegesis of the passages in the dialogues in which the pragmatics of science is set in motion, either explicitly as a theme or implicitly as a presupposition. The game of dialogue, with its specific requirements, encapsulates that pragmatics the enveloping within itself its two functions of research and teaching. We encounter some of the same rules previously enumerated, argumentation with a view only to consensus, the, un the unicity of the referent as a guarantee for the possibility of agreement, parity between partners 
and even any indirect recognition that it is a question of a game and not a destiny, since those who refuse to accept the rules out of weakness or crudeness are excluded. There remains the fact that, given the scientific nature of the game, the questions of its own legitimacy must be among those raised in the dialogues, a well-known example of this, which is all the more important since it links the quest this question to that of socio-political authority from the start, is to be found in Books 6 and 7 of the Republic. As we know, the answer, at least part of it, comes in the form of a narrative, the Allegory of the Cave, which recounts how, and why, men yearn for narratives and fail to recognise knowledge. Knowledge is founded on the narrative of its own martyrdom. There is more. The legitimation effort the Dialogues of Plato gives ammunition to narrative by virtue of its own form. Each of the dialogues takes the form of a narrative of a scientific discussion. It is of little consequence here that the story of the debate is shown rather than reported, staged rather than narrated, and is therefore more closely related to tragedy than epic. The fact is that the Platonic discourse that inaugurates science is not scientific, precisely to that extent that it attempts to legitimate science. Scientific knowledge cannot know and make known that it is the true knowledge without resorting to the other narrative kinds of knowledge, which from its point of view is no knowledge at all. Without such recourse, it would be in the position of presupposing its own validity and would be stooping to what it condemns, begging the question, proceeds in on prejudice, but does it not fall into the same trap by using narrative as its authority? This is not the place to chart the recurrence of the narrative in the scientific by way of the latter's discourses of legitimation, which include, but are not limited to, the great ancient, medieval, and classical philosophers endless torment. As resolute as a philosophy as that of Descartes can only demonstrate the legitimacy of science through what Valerie called the story of a mind, or else in a Bildungs Roman, which is what the discourse and method amounts to. Aristotle was doubtless one of the most modern of all, in separating the rules to which statements declared scientific must conform, the organon, from the search for the legitimacy in a discourse on being, the metaphysics. Even more modern was the suggestion that scientific knowledge, including its pretension to express the being of the referent, is composed only of arguments and proofs, in other words, of dialectics. With modern knowledge, two new features appear in the problematic of legitimation. To begin with, it leaves behind the metaphysical search for a first proof or transcend transcendental authority as a response to the question, how do you prove the proof? Or more generally, who decides the conditions of truth? It is recognized that the conditions of truth, in other words, the rules of the game of science, are imminent in that game, that they can only be established within the bound bonds of a debate that is already scientific in nature, that there is no other proof that the rules are good than the consent is extended to them by the experts. Accompanying the modern proclivity to define the conditions of a discourse in a discourse on those conditions is a renewed dignity for narrative popular cultures already noticeable in Renaissance humanism and variously present in the Enlightenment, the Sturm und Strang, German idealist philosophy and the historical school in France. Narration is no longer an involuntary lapse in the legitimation process. The explicit appeal to narrative in the problematic of knowledge is concomitant with the liberation of the bourgeois classes from the traditional authorities. Narrative knowledge makes a resurgence in the West as a way of solving the problem of legitimating the new authorities. It is natural in a narrative problematic for such a question to solicit the name of a hero as its response. Who has the right to decide for society? Who is the subject 
whose prescriptions are not always for those they obligate. This way of inquiring into socio-political legitimacy combines with the new scientific attitude. The name of the hero is the people, the sign of legitimacy is the people's consensus, and their mode of creating norms is deliberation. The notion of progress is a necessary outgrowth of this. It represents nothing other than the movement by which knowledge is presumed to accumulate, but this movement is extended to the new socio-political subject. The people debate among themselves about what is just or unjust in the same way that the scientific community debates about what is true or false. They accumulate civil laws just as scientists accumulate scientific laws. They perfect the rules of consensus just as the scientists produce new paradigms to revise their rules in light of what they have learned. It is clear that what is meant here by the people is entirely different from what is implied by traditional narrative knowledge, which, as we have seen, requires to institution instituting deliberation, no cumulative progression, no pretension to universality. These are the operators of scientific knowledge. It is therefore not at all surprising that the representatives of the new process of legitimation by the people should be at the same time actively involved in storing the traditional knowledge of peoples proceeds from the point, from that point forward, as minorities or potential separatist movements destined only to spread obscurantism. We can see too that the real existence of this necessarily abstract subject is abstract because it is uniquely modelled on the paradigm of the subject of knowledge. That is one who sends. Receives denotative statements with truth value to the exclusion of other language games depends on the institutions within which that subject is supposed to deliberate and decide, which comprise all or part of the state. The question of the state become in, becomes intimately entwined with that of scientific knowledge, but it's also clear that this interlocking is many sided. The people, the nation, or even humanity and especially the political institutions, are not content to know. They legislate. That is, they formulate prescriptions that have the status of norms. They, therefore, exercise their competence not only with respect to denotative utterances concerning what is true, but also prescriptive utterances for pretensions to justice. As already said, what characterizes a narrative knowledge what forms the basis of our conception of it, precisely that it combines both of these kinds of competence, not to mention all the others. The modes of legitimation we are discussing, which reintroduces narrative as the validity of knowledge, can thus take two routes. Depending on whether it represents the subject of the narrative as cognitive or practical, as a hero of knowledge or a hero of liberty, because of this alternative, not only does the meaning of legitimation vary, but it is already apparent that narrative itself is incapable of describing that meaning adequately. Nine, Narratives of the Legitimation of Knowledge We shall examine two major versions of the narrative of legitimation. One is more political the other more philosophical. Both are of great importance in modern history, in, particularly, in particular in the history of knowledge and its institutions. The subject of the first of these versions is humanity as the hero of liberty. All peoples have a right to science. If the social subject is not already the subject of scientific knowledge, it is because that has been forbidden by priests and tyrants. The right to science must be reconquered, it is understandable that this narrative would be directed more towards a politics of primary education rather than of universities and high schools. The educational policy of the French Third Republic powerfully illustrates these presuppositions. It seems that this narrative finds it necessary to de-emphasize higher education. Accordingly, 
the measures adopted by Napoleon regarding higher education are generally considered to have been motivated by the desire to produce the administrative and professional skills necessary for the stability of the state. This overlooks the fact that in the context of the narrative of freedom, the state receives its legitimacy not from itself, but from the people. So even if imperial po politics designated the institutions of higher education as a breeding ground for the offices of the state and secondarily for the managers of civil society, it did so because the nation as a whole was supposed to win its freedom through the spread of new domains of knowledge to the population, a process to be affected through agencies and professions within those cadres would fulfill their functions. The same reasoning is a fortiori valid for the foundation of properly scientific institutions. The state resorts to the narrative of freedom every time it assumes direct control over the training of the people under the name of the nation in order to point them down the path of progress. With the second narrative of legitimation, the relation between science, the nation and the state develops quite quickly, quite differently. It first appears with a founding between 1807 and 1810 of the University of Berlin, whose influence on the organization of higher education in the young countries of the world was to be considerable in the 19th and 20th centuries. At the time of the university's creation, the Prussian ministry had before it a project conceived by Fichte and counter-proposals by Schleier Macker. Wilhelm von Humboldt had to decide the matter and came down on the side of Schleyer Macker's more liberal option. Reading Humboldt's report, one may be tempted to reduce his entire approach to the politics of the scientific institution to the famous dictum, science for its own sake. But this would be too, mis too misunderstood the ultimate aim of his policies which is guided by the principle of legitimation we are discussing and is very close to the one Schleiermacher elucidates in a more thorough fashion. Humboldt does, not, does indeed declare that science obeys its own rules, that the scientific institution lives and continually renews itself on its own, with no constraint or determined goal whatsoever. But he adds that the university should orient its constitution constituent element, science, to the spiritual and moral training of the nation. How can this Bildung effect result from the disinterested pursuit of learning? Are not the state, the nation, the whole of humanity, indifferent to knowledge for its own sake? What interests them, as Humboldt admits, is not learning, but character and action. The minister's advisor thus faces a major conflict in some ways reminiscent of the split introduced by the Kantian critique between knowing and willing. It is a conflict between the language game made of denotations, answerable only to the criterion of truth, and a language game governing ethical, social and political practice that necessarily involves decisions and obligations. In other words, utterance is expected to be just rather than true, in which in the final analysis lies outside the realm of scientific knowledge. However, the unification of these two sets of discourses is indispensable to the building aimed for by Humboldt's project, which consists not only in the acquisition of learning by individuals, but also in the training of a fully legitimated subject of knowledge in society. Humboldt therefore invokes a spirit, what Fixer calls life, animated by three ambitions, or better, by a th single threefold aspiration, that of deriving everything from an original principle, corresponding to scientific activity, that of relating everything to an ideal, governing ethical and social practice, and that of unifying this principle and this ideal in a single idea, ensuring that the scientific search for true,
causes always coincides with the pursuit of just ends in moral and political life. This ultimate synthesis constitutes the legitimate subject. Humboldt adds in passing that this true triple aspiration naturally inheres in the intellectual character of the German nation. This is a concession, but a discreet one, to the other narrative, to the idea that the subject of knowledge is the people. But in truth, this idea is quite distant from the narrative of the legitimation of knowledge advanced by German idealism. There's a suspicion that men like Schleier, Macker, Humboldt, and even Hegel harbour towards the state is an indication of this. If Schleier, Macker, fears the narrow nationalism, protectionism, utilitarianism, and positivism that guide the public authorities in matters of science, it is because the principle of science does not reside in those authorities, even indirectly. The subject of knowledge is not the people, but the speculative spirit. It is not embodied, as in France, after the revolution in a state, but in a system. This language game of legitimation is not state political, but philosophical. The great function to be fulfilled by the universities is to lay upon the whole body of learning and expound both the principles and the foundations of all knowledge. For there is no creative scientific capacity without the speculative spirit. Speculation is here the name given the discourse on the legitimation of scientific discourse. Schools are functional. The university is speculative, that is to say, philosophical. Philosophy must restore unity to learning, which has been scattered into separate pieces, separate sciences and laboratories, and in pre-university education. It can only achieve this in a language game that links the sciences together as moments in the becoming of spirit, in other words, which links them in an, a rational narration, or rather meta-narration. Hegel's Encyclopedia, 1817-27, attempts to, re to realise this project of, tota of totalisation, which is already present in Fichte and Schelling in the form of the idea of the system. It is here, in the mechanism of developing a life that is simultaneously subject, that we see a return of narrative of knowledge. There is a universal history of spirit. Spirit is life, and life is its own self-presentation and formulation, in the ordered knowledge of all of its forms, contained in the empirical sciences. The Encyclopedia of German Idealism is the narration of the history of this life subject. What it produces is a meta-narrative, for the story's narrator must not be a people mired in the particular positivity of its traditional knowledge, not even scientists taken as a whole, since they are sequestered in professional frameworks corresponding to their respective specialties. The narrator must be a meta-subject in the process of formulating both the legitimacy of the discourses of the empirical sciences and that of the direct institutions of popular cultures. This meta-subject, in giving voice to their common grounding, realises their implicit goal. It inhabits the speculative university, positive science, and the people are only crude versions of it. The only valid way for the nation-state itself to bring the people to expression is through the mediation of speculative knowledge. It has been necessary to elucidate the philosophy that legitimated the foundation of the University of Berlin and was meant to be the motor both of its development and the development of contemporary knowledge. As I have said, many countries in the 19th and 20th centuries adopted this university organization as a model for the foundation or reform of their own system of higher education, beginning with the United States. But, of all, but above all, this philosophy, which is far from dead, especially in university circles, offers a particularly vivid representation of one solution to the problem of the legitimacy of knowledge. Research and the spread of learning are not just justified by invoking a principle of usefulness, 
The idea is not at all that science should serve the interests of the state or of civil society. The humanist principle that humanity rises up in dignity and freedom through knowledge is left by the wayside. German idealism has recourse to a meta-principle that simultaneously grounds the development of learning, of society, and of the state in the realization of the life of a subject called divine life by Victor and life of the spirit by Hegel. In this perspective, knowledge first finds legitimacy within itself, and it is knowledge that is entitled to say that, that what the state and what society are, but it can only play this role by changing levels, by ceasing to be, by ceasing to be simply the positive knowledge of its reference, nature, society, the state, becoming, in addition to that, the knowledge of the knowledge of the reference. That is, by becoming speculative in the names life and spirit, knowledge names itself. <clears throat> A noteworthy result of the speculative apparatus is that all of the discourses of learning about every possible reference are taken up not from the point of view of their immediate truth value, but in terms of the value they acquire by virtue of occupying a certain place in the itinerary of spirits or life, or of preferred, a certain position in the encyclopedia recounted by speculative discourse. That discourse cites them in the process of expounding for itself what it knows, that is, in the process of self-exposition. True knowledge, in this perspective, is always indirect knowledge. It is composed of reported statements that are incorporated into the meta-narrative of a subject that guarantees their legitimacy. The same thing applies for every variety of discourse, even if it is not a discourse of learning. Examples are the discourse of law and that of the state. Contemporary hermeneutic discourse is born of this presupposition which guarantees that there is meaning to know and thus confers legitimacy upon history and especially the history of learning. Statements are treated as their own autonyms and set in motion in a way that is supposed to render them mutually engendering. These are the rules of speculative language. The university, as its name indicates, is its exclusive institution. But as I have said, the problem of legitimacy can be solved using the other procedures as well. The difference between them should be kept in mind. Today, with the status of knowledge unbalanced and a speculative unity broken, the first version of legitimacy is gaining new vigour. According to this version, knowledge finds its validity not within itself, not in a subject that develops by actualizing its learning possibilities, but in a practical subject, humanity. The principle of the movement animating the people is not the self-legitimation of knowledge, but the self-grounding of freedom, or if preferred, its self-management. This subject is concrete, or supposedly so, and its epic is the story of its emancipation from everything that prevents it from governing itself. It is assumed that the laws it makes for itself are just, not because they conform to some outside nature, but because the legislators are. Constitutionally, the very citizens who are subject to the laws, as a result, the legislators will, the desire that the laws be just, will always coincide with the will of the citizen who desires the law and will therefore obey it. Clearly, the mode of legitimation through the autonomy of the will gives priority to a totally different language game, which Kant calls imperative and is known today as prescriptive. The important thing is not or not only, to legitimate denotative utterances pertaining to the truth, such as, the earth revolves around the sun, but rather to legitimate prescriptive utterances pertaining to justice, such as, Carthage must be destroyed, or, the minimum wage must be set at X dollars. In this context, the only role positive knowledge can play is to inform the practical subject about the reality within which the execution of the prescription is being scribed. It allows the subject to circumscribe the executable or what it is possible to do. But the executory, what should be done, is not within the purview of positive knowledge. 
It is one thing for an undertaking to be possible, and another for it to be just. Knowledge is no longer the subject, but in the service of the subject it's only legitimacy. Though it is formidable, is the fact that it allows morality to become reality. This introduces a relation of knowledge to society and the state, which is in principle a relation of the means to the ends. But scientists must cooperate only if they judge that the politics of the state, in other words, the sum of its prescriptions, are just, is just. If they feel that the civil society of which they are members is badly represented by the state, they may reject its prescriptions. This type of legitimation grants that the authority, as practical human beings, to refuse their scholarly support to a political power they judge to be unjust, in other words, not grounded in a real autonomy. They can even go so far as to use their expertise to demonstrate that such autonomy is not in fact realised in society and the state. This reintroduces the critical function of knowledge, but the fact remains that knowledge has no final legitimacy outside of serving the goals envisioned by the practical subject, the autonomous collectivity. This distribution of roles in the enterprise of legitimation is interesting from our point of view because it assumes, as against the system's subject theory, that there is no possibility that language games can be unified or totalized in any meta-discourse. Quite to the contrary, here the priority according prescriptive statements uttered by the practical subject renders them independent in principle from the statements of science, whose only remaining function is to supply this subject with information. Two remarks. It would be easy to show that Marxism has wavered between the two models of narrative legitimation I have just described. The party takes the place of the university, the proletariat, that of the people, or of humanity, dialectical materialism, that of speculative idealism, etc. Stalinism may be the result with its specific relationship with the sciences. In Stalinism, the sciences only figure as citations from the meta narrative of a march towards socialism, which is the equivalent of the life of the spirit. But on the other hand, Marxism can, in conformity to the second version, develop into a form of critical knowledge by declaring that socialism is nothing other than the constitution of the autonomous subject, and that the only justification for the sciences is if they give the empirical subject, the proletariat, the means to emancipate itself from alienation and repression. Repression. This was brief, briefly the position of the Frankfurt School. The speech Heidegger, he, the speech Heidegger gave on May the twenty seventh, nineteen thirty three, on becoming rector of the University of Freiburg in Breisgau can be read as an unfortunate episode in the history of legitimation. Here, speculative science has become the questioning of being. This questioning is the destiny of the German people, dubbed an historico-spiritual people. To this subject are owed the free services of labour, defence and knowledge. This uni The university guarantees a meta-knowledge of the three services, that is to say, science, here, as in idealism, legitimation is achieved through a meta-discourse called science with ontological pretensions, but here the meta-discourse of questioning, not totalizing, and the university, the home of this meta-discourse, owes its knowledge to a people whose historic mission is to bring that meta-discourse to fruition by working, fighting, and knowing. The calling of this people's subject is not to a emancipate humanity, but to realise its true world of the spirit, which is the most profound power of conservation to be found within its forces of earth and blood. This insertion of the narrative of race and work into that of the spirit as way of legitimating knowledge and its institutions is doub doubly unfortunate. Theoretically inconsistent, it was compelling enough to find disastrous echoes in the realm of politics. 10. Delegitimation in contemporary society and culture, post-industrial society, postmodern culture, the question of the legitimation of knowledge is formulated in different terms. 
The grand narrative has lost its credibility, regardless of what mode of unification it uses, regardless of whether it's a speculative narrative or a narrative of, am of emancipation. The decline of narrative can be seen as an effect, as an effect of the blossoming of techniques and technologies since the Second World War, which has shifted emphasis from the ends of action to its means. It can also be seen as an effect of the redeployment of advanced liberal capitalism after its retreat in, under the protection of Keynesianism during the period of 1930-60, to 60, a renewal that has, that has eliminated the communist alternative and valorized the individual enjoyment of goods and services. Any time we go searching for causes in this way, we are bound to be disappointed. Even if we adopted one or the other of these hypotheses, we would still have to detail the correlation between the tendencies mentioned and the decline of the unifying and legitimating power of the grand narratives of speculation and emancipation. It is, of course, understandable that both capitalist renewal and prosperity and the disorienting upsurge of technology would have an impact on the status of knowledge. In order to understand how contemporary science could have been susceptible to those effects long before they took place, we must first locate the seeds of delegitimation and nihilism that were inherent in the grand narratives of the 19th century. First of all, the speculative apparatus maintains an ambiguous relation to knowledge, it shows that knowledge is only worthy of that name to the extent that it reduplicates itself, lifts itself up, is ablated, by citing its own statements in a second level discourse, autonomy, autonomy, that the functions to legitimate them. This is as much as to say that in its immediacy, denotative discourse bearing on a certain reference, a living organism, a chemical property, a physical phenomenon, phenomenon, does not really know what it thinks it knows. Positive science is not a form of knowledge, and speculation feeds on its suppression. The Hegelian speculative narrative thus harbors a certain skepticism toward positive learning, as Hegel himself admits. A science that is not legitimated itself is not a true science. If the discourse that was meant to legitimate it seems to belong to a pre-scientific form of knowledge, like a vulgar narrative, it is demoted to the lowest rank, that of an ideology or instrument of power. And this always happens if the rules of the science game that discourse denounces as empirical are applied to science itself. Take, for example, the speculative statement. A scientific statement is knowledge if and only if it can take its place in a universal process of engendering. The question is, is this statement knowledge as it itself defines it? Only if it can take its place in a universal process of engendering, engendering which it can, all it has to do is to presuppose that such a process exists, a life of spirit, and that it is itself an expression of that process. This presupposition, in fact, is indispensable to the speculative language game. Without it, the language of legitimation would not be legitimate. It would accompany science in a nosedive into nonsense, at least if we take idealism's word for it. But this presupposition can also be understood in a totally different sense one which takes us in the direction of postmodern culture. We could say, in keeping with the perspective we adopted earlier, that this presupposition defines the set of rules one must accept in order to play the speculative game. Such an appraisal assumes first that we accept that the positive scientists represent the general mode of knowledge, second, that we understand this language to imply certain formal and axiomatic presuppositions that it must always make explicit. This is exactly what Nietzsche is doing, th though with a different terminology which he, when he shows that European nihilism resulted from the truth requirements of science being turned back against itself. There thus arises an idea of perspective that is not far removed, at least in this respect from the idea of language games. What we have here is a process of de-legitimation, 
fueled by the, the, the demands for legitimation itself. The crisis of signs of acknowledge, signs of which have been accumulating since the end of the 19th century, is not born of a chance proliferation of sciences itself and effects of progress in technology and the expansion of capitalism, but represents rather an internal erosion of the legitimacy principle of knowledge. There is erosion at work inside the speculative game, and by loosening the weave of the encyclopedic net in which each science was to find its place, it eventually sets them free. The classical dividing lines between the various fields of science are thus called into question. Disciplines disappear, overlapping secure at the borders between sciences, and from these new territories are born. The speculative hierarchy of learning gives way to an imminent and, as it were, flat network of areas of inquiry, the respective frontiers of which are in constant flux. The old faculties, split into, in into institutes and foundations of all kinds, and the universities lose their function of speculative legitimation, stripped of the responsibility for research, which was stifled by the speculative narrative, they limit themselves to the transmission of what is judged to be established knowledge, and through didactics they guarantee the replication of teachers rather than the production of researchers. This is the state in which Nietzsche finds and condemns them. The potential for erosion intrinsic to the other legitimation process, the, the other legitimation procedure the emancipation apparatus flowing from the Aufklärung is no less extensive than the one at work of spec within speculative discourse, but it touches a different aspect. Its distinguishing characteristic is that it grounds the legitimation of science and truth in the autonomy of interlocutors involved in ethical, social and political praxis. As we have seen, there are immediate problems with this form of legitimation. The difference between a denotative statement with a cognitive value and a prescriptive statement with practical value is one of relevance, therefore of competence. There is nothing to prove that if a statement describing a real situation is true, it follows that a prescriptive statement based upon it, the effects of which will necessarily be a modification of that reality, will be just. Take, for example, a closed door. Between the door is closed and open the door, there is no relation of consequence as defined in propositional logic. The two statements belong to two autonomous sets of rules, defining different kinds of relevance, and therefore of competence. Here, the effects of dividing reason into cognitive or theoretical reason on the one hand and practical reason on the other is to attack the legitimacy of the discourse of science, not directly, but indirectly, by revealing that it is a language game with its own rules of which the a priori conditions of knowledge and can't provide a first glimpse that it has no special calling to supervise the game of praxis, nor the game of aesthetics for that matter. The game of science thus puts on a par with the others. And if this delegitimation is pursued in the slightest, and if its scope is widened as Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein does in his own way, and thinkers such as Martin Buber and Emmanuel Levinas in theirs, the road is then open for an important current of post-modernity, science plays its own game, it is incapable of legitimating the other language games, the game of prescription, for example, escapes it, but above all, it is incapable of legitimating itself, as speculation assumes it could. The social subject itself seems to dissolve in the dissemination of language games, the social bond is linguistic, but it is not woven with a single thread. It is a fabric formed by the intersection of at least two, and in reality in an, in an indeterminate number, of language games, 
obeying different rules. Wittgenstein writes, Our language can be seen as an ancient city, a maze of little streets and squares, of old and new houses, and of houses with additions from various periods, and this surrounded by a multitude of new boroughs, with straight regular streets and uniform houses, and to try at home that the principle of unitotality, or synthesis under the authority of a meta discourse of knowledge, is inapplicable, he subjects the town of language the, to the old Sorites paradox by asking, how many houses or streets does it take before a town begins to be a town? New languages are added to the old ones, forming suburbs of the old town, the symbolism of chemistry and the notation of the infinitesimal calculus. Thirty-five years later, we can add to the list machine languages, the matrices of game theory, new systems of musical notation, systems of notation for, de for non-denotative forms of logic, temporal logics, deontic logics, modal logics, the language of the genetic code, graphs of phonological structures, and so on. We may form a pessimistic impression of the splintering. Nobody speaks all of those languages. They have no universal meta-language. The project of the system subject is a failure. The goal of emancipation has nothing to do with science. We're all stuck in the positivism of this or that discipline of learning. The learned scholars have turned into scientists. The diminished tasks of research have become compartmentalized and no one can master them all. Speculative or humanistic philosophy is forced to relinquish its legitimation duties, which explains why philosophy is facing a crisis wherever it persists in arrogating such functions and is reduced to the study of systems of logic or the history of ideas where it has been realistic and not surrender them. Turn of the century, Vienna was weans on this pessimism, not just artists such as Musil, Krauss, have Mansthal, Lewis, Schoenberg, and Brock, but also the philosophers Mack and Wittgenstein. They carried awareness of and theoretical and artistic responsibility for delegitimation as far as it could be taken. We can say today that the mourning process has been completed. There is no need to start all over again. Wittgenstein's strength is that he did not opt for the positivism that was being developed by the Vienna Circle but outlined in his investigation of language games a kind of legitimation not based on performativity. That is what the postmodern world is all about. Most people have lost the nostalgia for the lost narrative. It is no way it in no way follows that they are reduced to barbarity. What saves them from it is their knowledge that legitimation can only spring from their own linguistic practice and communicational interaction. Science smiling into its beard, and every other belief has taught them the harsh austerity of realism. 11. Research and its legitimation through performativity. Let us return to science and begin by examining the pragmatics of research. Its essential mechanisms are presently undergoing two important changes a multiplication in methods of argumentation and a rising complexity level in the process of establishing proof. Aristotle, Descartes, and John Stuart Mill, among others, attempted to lay down the rules governing how a denotative utterance can obtain its addressee's assent. Scientific knowledge sets in no great store by these methods. As already stated, it can and does use methods, the demonstrative properties of which seem to challenge classical reason. Bacalard compiles a list of them, and is already incomplete. These languages are not employed haphazardly, however. Their use is subject to a condition we would call pragmatic. Each must formulate its own rules and petition the addressee to accept them. To satisfy this condition, an axiomatic is defined that includes a definition of symbols to be used in the proposed language. A description of the form, expressions, and language must take in order to, to, to gain acceptance, well-formed expressions, and an, an enumeration of the operations that may be performed on the accepted expressions, axioms, in the narrow sense. 
But how do we know what an axiomatic should or does in fact contain? The conditions listed above are formal conditions. There has to be a meta-language to determine whether a given language satisfies the formal conditions of an axiomatic. That meta-language is logic. At this point, a brief clarification is necessary. The alternative between someone who begins by establishing an axiomatic and then uses it to produce what are defined as acceptable statements, and a scientist who begins by establishing and stating facts and then tries to discover the axiomatics of the language he used in making his statements is not a logical alternative, but only an empirical one. It is certainly of great importance for the researcher and also for the philosopher, but in each case the question of the validation of statements is the same. The following question is more pertinent to legitimation. By what criteria does the logician define the properties required of an axiomatic? Is there a model for scientific languages? If so, is there just one? Is it verifiable? The properties generally required of the syntax of a formal system are, are consistency. For example, a system inconsistent with respect to negation would admit both a proposition and its opposite. Syntactic completeness, a system would lose its consistency if an axiom is added to it. Decidability, there must be an effective procedure for deciding whether a given proposition belongs to the system or not. And the independence of the axioms in relation to one another. Now, Gödel has effectively established the existence in the arithmetic system of a proposition that is neither de demonstrable nor refutable within the system. This entails that the arithmetic system fails to satisfy the condition of completeness. Since it is possible to generalize the situation, it must be accepted that all formal systems have internal limitations. This applies to logic. The meta-language it uses to describe an artificial axiomatic language in is natural or everyday language. That language is universal, since all other languages can be translated into it, but it's not consistent with respect to negation. It allows the formation of paradoxes. This necessitates a reformulation of the question of the legitimation of knowledge. When a denotative statement is declared true, there is a presupposition that the axiomatic system within which it is decidable and demonstrable has already been formulated, that it is known to the interlocutors, and that they have accepted that it is as formally satisfactory as possible. This was the spirit in which the mathematics of the Borbeka group was developed. But analogous observations can be made for the other sciences. They owe their status to the existence of a language whose rules of functioning cannot themselves be demonstrated, but are, but are the subject of a consensus among experts. These rules, or at least some of them, are requests. The request is a modality of prescription. The argumentation required for a scientific statement to be accepted is the subordinated to a first acceptance, which is in fact constantly renewed by virtue of the principle of recursion of the rules defining the allowable means of argumentation. Two noteworthy properties of scientific knowledge result from this, the flexibility of its means, that is, the plurality of its languages, and its character as a pragmatic game, the acceptability of the moves, new propositions, made in it depends on a contract drawn between the partners. Another result is that there are two different kinds of progress in knowledge. One corresponds to a new move, a new argument within the established rules, the other to the invention of new rules, in other words, a change to a new game. Obviously, a major shift in the notion of reason accompanies this new arrangement. The principle of a universal meta-language is replaced by the principle of a plurality of formal and axiomatic systems capable of arguing the truth of denotative statements. These statements are described by a meta-language that is universal, but not consistent. 
what use to pass a paradox and even paralogism in the knowledge of classical and modern science can, in searching of these systems, acquire a new force of conviction and win the acceptance of the community of experts. The language game method I have followed here can claim a modest place in this current of thoughts. The other fundamental aspect of research, the production of proof, takes us in quite a different direction. It is in principle part of an argumentation process designed to win acceptance for a new statement. For example, giving testimony or presenting an, ex an exhibit in the case of judicial rhetoric. But it presents a special problem. It is here that the referent reality is called to, to the stand incited in the debate between scientists. I have already made the point that the question of proof is problematic. Well, since proof needs to be proven, one can be by publishing the description of how the proof was obtained so other scientists can check the result by repeating the same process, but the fact still has to be observed in order to be proven, to stand proven. What constitutes a scientific observation? A fact that has been registered by an eye, an ear, a sense organ? As senses are deceptive and their range and powers of discrimination are limited, this is where technology comes in. Technical devices originated as prosthetic aids for the human organs or its physiological systems whose function is to receive data or condition the context. They follow a principle, and it is the principle of optimal performance, maximizing output, the information or modifications obtained, and minimizing input, the energy expended in the process. Technology is therefore a game pertaining not to the true, just or the beautiful, etc., but to efficiency. A technical move is good when it does better and or expends less energy than another. This definition of technical competence is a late development. For a long time, inventions came in bits and starts, the products of chance research or research as much or more concerned with the arts, techni, than with knowledge. The Greeks of the classical period, for example, established no close relationship between knowledge and technology. In the 16th and 17th centuries, the work of prospectus was still a matter of curiosity and artistic innovation. This was the case until the end of the 18th century, and it can be maintained that even today, wild activities of technical invention, sometimes related to brick college, still go on outside the imperatives of scientific argumentation. Nonetheless, the need for proof becomes increasingly strong as the pragmatics of scientific knowledge replaces traditional knowledge or knowledge based on revelation. By the end of the Discourse on Method, Descartes is already asking for labor laboratory funds, a new problem appears, devices that optimize the performance of the human body for the pr purpose of producing proof require additional expenditures, no money, no proof. That means no verification of statements and no truth. The games of scientific language become the games of the rich, in which whoever is wealthiest has the best chance of being right. An equation between wealth, efficiency and truth is thus established. What happens at the end of the 18th century, which the, with the first industrial revolution, is that the reciprocal of this equation was discovered. No technology without wealth no wealth without technology, a technical apparatus requires an investment, but since it optimizes the efficiency of the task to which it is applied, it also optimizes the surplus value derived from this improved performance. All that is needed is for the surplus value to be realized, in other words, the product of the task performed to be sold, and the system can be sealed in the following way. A portion of the sale is recycled into a research fund dedicated to further performance improvement. It is at this precise moment that science becomes a force of production, in other words, a moment in the circulation of capital. It was more, desire, it was more the desire for wealth than the desire for knowledge than initially forced upon technology 
the imperative of performance improvements and product realization, the organic connection between technology and profit preceded its union with science. Technology became important to contemporary knowledge only through the mediation of a generalized spirit of performativity. Even today, progress in knowledge is not totally subordinated to technological investment. Capitalism solves the scientific problem of research funding in its own way, directly by financing research departments in private companies in which demand for performativity and recommercialization orient research first and foremost towards technological applications and directly by creating private, state or mixed sector research foundations that grant program subsidies to university departments research laboratories and independent research groups with no expectation of an immediate return on the results of the work. This is done on the theory that research must be financed at a loss for a certain length of time in order to increase the probability of its yielding a decisive and therefore highly profitable innovation. Nation states, especially in their Keynesian period, follow the same rule. Applied research on the one hand, basic research on the other. They collaborate with corporations through an array of agencies. The prevailing corporate norms of work management spread to the applied science laboratories, hierarchy, centralized decision making, teamwork, calculation of individual and collective returns, the development of saleable programs, market research, and so on. Centres dedicated to pure research suffer from this less, but also receive less funding. The production of proof, which is in principle only part of an argumentation process designed to win agreement from the addressees of scientific messages, thus falls under the control of another language game, in which the goal is no longer truth, but performativity. That is the best possible input-output equation. The state and our company must abandon the idealist and humanist narratives of legitimation in order to justify the new goal. In the discourse of the day's financial backers of research, the only credible goal is power. Scientists, technicians and instruments are purchased not to find truth, but to augment power. The question is to determine what the discourse of power consists of and if it can cons constitute a legitimation. At first glance, it is prevented from doing so by the traditional distinction between force and right, between force and wisdom, in other words, between what is strong, what is just, and what is true. I referred to this incommensurability earlier in terms of the theory of language games when I distinguished the denotative game in which what is relevant is the true, false distinction from the prescriptive game, in which the just, unjust distinction pertains from the technical game, in which the criterion is the efficient, inefficient distinction. Force appears to belong exclusively to the last game, the game of technology. I am excluding the case in which force operates by means of terror. That This lies outside the realm of language games because the efficacy of such force is based entirely on th the threat to eliminate the opposing player, not on making a better move than he. Whenever efficiency, that is, obtaining the desired effect, is derived from a say or do this or else you'll never speak again, then we are in the realm of terror and the social bond is destroyed. But the fact remains that since performativity increases the ability to produce proof, it also increases the ability to be right. The technical criterion introduced on massive scale into scientific knowledge cannot fail to influence the truth criterion. The same has been said of the relationship between justice and performance. The probability that an order would be pronounced just was said to increase with its chances of being implemented, which would in turn increase with the performance capability of the prescriber. This led Lumen to hypothesize that in post-industrial societies, 
the normativity of laws is replaced by the performativity of procedures, context, context control, in other words, performance improvement, one at the expense of the partner or partners constituting that context, be they nature or men, can pass for a kind of legitimation, de facto legitimation. This procedure operates within the following framework since reality is what provides the evidence used as proof in scientific argumentation and also provides prescriptions and promises of a juridical, ethical and political nature with results, one can master all of these games by mastering reality. That is precisely what technology can do. By reinforcing technology, one reinforces reality, and one's chances of being just and right increase accordingly, reciprocally, Technology is reinforced all the more effectively if one has access to scientific knowledge and decision-making authority. This is how legitimation by power takes shape. Power is not only good performativity, but also effective verification and good verdicts. It legitimates science and the law on the basis of their efficiency, and legitimates this efficiency on the basis of science and law. It is self-legitimating in the same way a system organized around performance maximization seems to be. Now it is precisely this kind of context control that a generalized computerization of society may bring. The performativity of an utterance, be it denotative or prescriptive, increases proportionally to the amount of information about its reference one has at one's disposal. Thus the growth of power and its self-legitimation are now taking the route of data storage and accessibility and the operativity of information. The relationship between science and technology is reversed. The complexity of, argu of the argumentation becomes relevant here, especially because it necessitates greater sophistication in the means of obtaining proof and that in turn benefits performativity. Research funds are allocated by states, corporations and nationalized companies in accordance with this logic of power growth. Research sectors that are unable to argue that they contribute even indirectly to the optimization of the system's performance are abandoned by the flow of capital and doomed to senescence. The criterion of performance is explicitly invoked by the authorities to justify the refusal to subsidize certain research centers. 12. Education and its legitimation through performativity. It should be easy to describe how the other facet of knowledge, its transmission or education, is affected by the predominance of the performativity criterion. If we accept the notion that there is an established body of knowledge the question of its transmission, from a pragmatic point of view, can be subdivided into a series of questions. Who transmits learning? What is transmitted? To whom? Through what medium? In what form? With what effects? A university policy is formed by a coherent set of answers to these questions. If the performativity of the supposed social system is taken as the criterion of relevance, that is, when the perspective of systems theory is adopted, Higher education becomes a subsystem of the social system, and the same performativity criterion is applied to each of these problems. The desired goal becomes the optimal contribution of higher education to the best performativity of the social system. Accordingly, it will have to create the skills that are indispensable to that system. These are of two kinds. The first kind are more specifically designed to tackle world competition. They vary according to which specialties the nation states or major educational institutions can sell on the world market. If our general hypothesis is correct, there will be a growth in demand for experts in high and middle management executives in the leading sectors mentioned at the beginning of this study, which is where the action will be in the years to come. Any discipline with applicability to training in telematics, computer scientists, cyberneticists, linguists, mathematicians, magicians will most likely receive priority 
in education, all the more so since an increase in the number of these experts should speed the research in other learning sectors, as has been the case with medicine and biology. Secondly, and still within the same general hypothesis, higher learning will have to continue to supply the social system within, with the skills fulfilling society's own needs, which center on maintaining its internal cohesion. Previously, this task entailed the formation and dissemination of a general model of life, most often legitimated by the emancipation narrative. In the context of delegitimation, universities and the institutions of higher learning are called upon to create skills and no longer ideals. So many doctors, so many teachers in a given discipline, so many engineers, so many administrators, etc. Their transmission of knowledge is no longer designed to train an elite capable of guiding the nation towards its emancipation, but to supply the system with players capable of acceptably fulfilling their roles and the pragmatic posts required by its institutions. If the ends of higher learning are functional, what of its addressees? The student has changed already and will certainly change more. He is no longer a youth from the liberal elite, more or less concerned with the great task of social pro progress understood in terms of emancipation. In this sense, the democratic university, no entrance requirements, little cost of the student and even the society, if the price per student is calculated, high enrollment, which is modelled along the principles of emancipationist humanism today, seems to offer little in the way of performance. Higher education is in fact already undergoing a major realignment, dictated both by administrative measures and by social demands, themselves rather uncontrolled, emanating from the new users. The tendency is to divide the functions of higher learning into two broad categories of services. In its function of professional training, higher education still addresses itself to the young of the liberal elite, to whom it transmits the competence judged necessary by each profession. They are joined through one route or another, for example, institutes of technology, all of which, however, conform to the same didactic model by the addressees of the new domains of knowledge linked to the new techniques and technologies, they are, once again, young people who have yet to become active. Aside from these two categories of students who reproduce the professional intelligentsia and the technical intelligentsia, the remainder of the young people present in the universities are for the most part unemployed who are not counted as job seekers in these statistics that the outnumber the openings in their disciplines, arts and human sciences. Despite their age, they do in fact belong to the new category of the addressees of knowledge. For in addition to its professionalist function, the university is beginning, or should begin, to play a new role in improving the system's performance that of job retraining and continuing education outside the universities, departments or institutions with a professional orientation, knowledge will no longer be transmitted and block once and for all to young people before their entry into the workforce. Rather, it is and will be served a la carte to adults who are either already working or expect to be for the purpose of improving their skills and chances of promotion, but also to help them acquire information, languages, and language games, allowing them both to widen their occupational horizons and to articulate their technical and ethical experience. The new course that the transmission of knowledge is taking is not without conflict, as much as it is in the interests of the system, and therefore of its decision makers, to encourage professional advancement, since it can only improve the performance of the whole, 
any experimentation in discourse, institutions, and values with the inevitable, inevitable disorders it brings in the curriculum, student supervision and testing, and pedagogy, not to mention its socio-political repercussions, is regarded as having little or no operational value and is not given the slightest credence in the same in the name of the seriousness of the system. Such experimentation offers an escape from functionalism that should not be dismissed lightly since it was functionalism itself that pointed the way. But it is safe to assume that responsibility for it will devolve upon extra university networks. In any case, even if the performativity principle does not always help pinpoint the policy to follow, its general effect is to subordinate the institutions of higher learning to the existing powers. The moment knowledge ceases to be an end in itself, the realization of the idea or the emancipation of men, its transmission is no longer the exclusive responsibility of scholars and students. The notion of university franchise now belongs to a bygone era. The autonomy granted the universities after the crisis of the late 1960s has very little meaning, given the fact that practically nowhere do teachers' groups have the power to decide what the budget of their institution will be. All they can do is allocate their funds that are assigned to them, and only then as the last step in the process. What is transmitted in higher learning? In the case of professional training and limiting ourselves to a narrowly functionalist point of view, an organized stock of established knowledge is the essential thing that is transmitted. The application of new technologies to this stock may have a considerable impact on the medium of communication. It does not seem ne absolutely necessary that the medium be a lecture delivered in person by a teacher in front of science students with questions reserved for sections or practical work sessions run by an assistant. To the extent that learning is translatable into computer language and that the traditional teacher is replaceable by memory banks, didactics can be entrusted to machines linked, linking traditional memory banks, libraries, etc., and computer data banks to intelligent terminals placed at the student's disposal. Pedagogy would not necessarily suffer. The students would still have to be taught something, not contents, but how to use the terminals. On the one hand, that means teaching new languages, and on the other, a more refined ability to handle the language game of interrogation. Where should the question be addressed? In other words, what is the relevant memory bank for what needs to be known? How should the question be formulated to avoid misunderstandings, etc.? From this point of view, elementary training in informatics, and especially telematics, should be a basic requirement in universities in the same way that fluency in a foreign language is now, for example. It is only in the context of the grand narratives of legitimation, the life of the spirit, and or the emancipation of humanity, that the partial replacement of teachers by machines may seem inadequate or even intolerable. But it is probable that these narratives are already no longer the principal driving force behind interest in acquiring knowledge. If the motivation is power, then this aspect of classical didacts it ceases to be relevant. The question, overt or implied, now asked by the professional student, the state, or institutions of higher education is no longer, is it true, but what use is it? In the context of the mercantilization of knowledge, more often than not, this question is equivalent to, is it saleable? And in the context of power growth, is it efficient? Having confidence in a performance-oriented skill does indeed seem saleable in the conditions described above and it is efficient by definition. What no longer makes the grade is competence, as defined by other criteria, true, false, just and just, etc. And, of course, low performativity in general. 
This creates the prospect for a vast market for competence in operational skills. Those who possess this kind of knowledge will be the objects of offers or even seduction policies. Seen in this light, what we are approaching is not the end of knowledge, quite the contrary. Data banks are the encyclopedia of tomorrow. They transcend the capacity of each of their users. They are nature for postmodern man. It should be noted, however, that didactics does not simply consist in the transmission of information. A competence, even when defined as a performance skill, does not simply reduce to having a good memory for data or having easy access to a computer. It is a commonplace that what is of utmost importance is the capacity to actualize the relevant data for solving a problem here and now, and to organize that data into an efficient strategy. As long as the game is not a game of perfect information, the advantage will be with the player who has knowledge and can obtain information. By definition, this is the case with a student in a learning situation, but in games of perfect information, the best performativity cannot consist in obtaining additional information in this way. It comes rather from arranging the data in a new way, which is what constitutes a move, properly speaking. This new arrangement is usually achieved by connecting together a series of data that were previously held to be independent. This capacity to articulate what used to be separate can be called imagination. Speed is one of its properties. It is possible to conceive the world of postmodern knowledge as governed by a game of perfect information in a sense that the data is in principle accessible to any expert. There is no scientific secret. Given equal competence, no longer in the acquisition of knowledge, but in its production, what extra performativity depends on in the final analysis is imagination, which allows one either to make a new move or change the rules of the game. If education must not only provide for the reproduction of skills, but also for their progress, then it follows that the transmission of knowledge should not be limited to the transmission of information, but should include training in all of the procedures that can increase one's ability to connect the fields jealously, jealously guarded from one another by the tradition or traditional organization of knowledge. The slogan of interdisciplinary studies, which became particularly popular after the crisis of 1968, but was being advocated long before that, seems to move in this direction. It ran up against the feudalism of the universities, they say. It ran, it ran up against more than that. In Humboldt's model of the university, each science has its own place in a system crowned by speculation. Any encroachment of one science into another's field can only create confusion, noise in the system. Collaboration can only take place on the level of speculation in the heads of the philosophers. The idea of an interdisciplinary approach is specific to the age of delegitimation and its hurried empiricism. The relation to knowledge is not articulated in terms of the realization of the life of the spirit or the emancipation of humanity, but in terms of the users of a complex conceptual and material machinery and those who benefit from its performance capabilities. They have at their disposal no meta-language or meta-narrative in which to formulate the final goal and correct use of that machinery, but they do have brainstorming to perform, improve its performance. The emphasis placed on teamwork is related to the predominance of the performativity criterion in knowledge. When it comes to speaking the truth or prescribing justice, numbers are meaningless. They only make a difference if justice and truth are thought, thought of in terms of the probability of success. In general, teamwork does in fact improve performance if it is done under certain conditions detailed long ago by social scientists. In particular, it has been established that teamwork is especially successful in, performing, in improving performativity within the framework of a given model, that is, for the implementation of a task. Its advantages seem less certain when the need is to imagine new models, in other words, on the level of their conception. There have apparently been cases, 
experiences where even this has worked, but it's it difficult to isolate what is attributable to the team setup and what derives from the individual talents of the team members. It will be observed that this orientation is concerned more with the production of knowledge research than its transmission. To separate them completely is to fall into abstraction and is probably counterproductive even within the, the framework of functionalism and professionalism, and yet the solution toward which in the institutions of knowledge all over the world are in fact moving consists in dissociating these two aspects of didactic, simple reproduction and extended reproduction. This is being done by earmarking entities of all kinds, institutions, levels of programs within institutions, groupings of institutions, groupings of disciplines, either for the selection and reproduction of professional skills, or for the promotion and stimulation of imaginative minds. The transmission channels to which the first category is given access can be simplified and made available on a mass scale. The second category has the privilege of working on a smaller scale in conditions of aristocratic egalitarianism. It matters little, matters little whether the latter are officially a part of the universities. But one thing that seems certain is that in both cases, the process of delegitimation and the predominance of the performance criterion are sounding the knell of the age of the professor. The professor is no more competent than memory bank networks in transmission established knowledge, no more competent than interdisciplinary teams in imagining new moves or new games. 13. Postmodern Science as the Search for Instabilities As previously indicated, the pragmatics of scientific research especially in its search for new methods of argumentation, emphasizes the invention of new moves, and even new rules for language games. We must now take a closer look at this aspect of the problem, which is of decisive importance in the present state of scientific knowledge. We could say, tongue-in-cheek, that scientific knowledge is seeking a crisis resolution, a resolution of the crisis of determinism. Determinism, as the hypothesis, upon which a legitimation by performativity is based. Since performativity is defined by an input-output ratio, there is a presupposition that the system into which the input is entered is stable, that system must follow a regular path, that it is possible to express as a continuous function possessing a derivative, so that an accurate prediction of the output can be made. Such is the positivist philosophy of efficiency. I will cite a number of prominent examples as evidence against it to facilitate the final discussion of legitimation. Briefly, the aim is to demonstrate, on the basis of a few exhibits, that the pragmatics of postmodern scientific knowledge per se has little affinity with the quest for performativity. Science does not expand by means of the positivism of efficiency. The opposite is true. Working on a proof means searching for and inventing counterexamples. In other words, the unintelligible supporting an argument means looking for a paradox and legitimating with new rules in the games of reasoning. In neither case is efficiency sort for its own sake. It comes sometimes tardily, as an extra when the grant givers finally decide to take an interest in the case. But what never fails to come again and again with every new theory, new hypothesis, new statement or new observation is the question of legitimacy. For it is not a, it is not philosophy that asks this question of science, but science that asks it of itself. What is outdated is not asking what is true and what is just, but viewing science as positivistic, relegating it to the status of unlegitimated learning half knowledge as did the German idealists. The question, what is your argument worth, what is your proof worth, is so much a part of the pragmatics of scientific knowledge that is what assures the transformation of the addressee of a giving argument and proof into the centre of a new argument and proof, thereby assuring the renewal of scientific discourse and the replacement of each generation of scientists. 
Science develops, and no one will deny that it develops. By developing this question, and this question, as it develops, leads to the following question, but it's a say, matter question, the question of legitimacy. What is your, what is it worth, worth? I made the point that the striking feature of postmodern scientific knowledge is that the discourse on the rules that validate it is explicitly imminent to it. What was considered at the end of the 19th century to be a loss of legitimacy and a fall into philosophical pragmatism or logical positivism was only an episode from which knowledge is recovered by including within scientific discourse the discourse on the validation of statements held to be laws. As we have seen, this inclusion is not a simple operation, but gives rise to paradoxes that are taken extremely seriously and to the limitations and the scope of knowledge that are in fact changes in its nature. The metamathematical research that led to Gödel's theorem is a veritable paradigm of how this change in nature takes place, but the transformation that dynamics has undergone is no less exemplary of the new scientific spirit. It is of particular interest here because it compels us to reconsider a notion that, as we have seen, figures prominently into the discussion of performance, particularly in the domain of social theory the notion of system. The idea of performance implies a highly stable system because it is, is based on the principle of a relation which is, in theory, always calculable between heat and work, hot, hot source and cold source, input and output. This idea comes from thermodynamics it is associated with the notion that the evolution of a system's performance can be predicated if all of the variables are known. The ideal fulfillment of this condition is clearly expressed in Laplace's fiction of the demon. He knows all of the variables determining the state of the universe at a moment t, and can thus predict its state at a moment t dash greater than t. This fiction is sustained by the principle that physical systems, including the system of systems called the universe, follow regular patterns, with the result that their evolution traces a regular path and gives rise to normal, continuous functions and to futurology. The, the advent of quantum mechanics and atomic, atomic physics has limited the range of applicability of this principle two ways, the respective implications of which differ in scope. First, a complete definition of the initial state of a system or all the independent variables would require an, an expenditure of energy at least equivalent to that consumed by the system to be defined, a layman's version of the de facto possibility of ever reaching a complete measure of any given state of a system is provided in a note by Bourges. An emperor wishes to have a perfectly accurate map of the, of the empire made. The project leads the country to ruin, the entire population devotes all its energy to cartography. Brillon's argument leads to the conclusion that the idea or ideology of perfect control over a system which is supposed to improve its performance is inconsistent with respect to the law of contradiction. It is in fact, it in fact lowers the performance level it claims to raise. This inconsistency explains the weakness of state and socio-economic bureaucracies. They stifle the systems of subsystems they control and asphyxiate themselves in the process. Negative feedback. The interest of such an explanation is that it has no need to invoke any form of legitimation outside the system itself. For example, the freedom of human agents inciting them to rise up against excessive authority. Even if we accept that society is a system, complete control over it, which would necessitate an exact definition of its initial state, is impossible because no such definition could ever be affected. But this legitimate but this limitation only calls into question the practice the practicability of exact knowledge, 
and the power that would result from it. They, would, they remain possible in theory. Classical determinism continues to work within the framework of the unreachable, but conceivable limits of the total knowledge of a system. Quantum theory and microphysics requires a far more radical revision of the idea of a continuous and pre predictable path. The quest for precision is not limited by its cost, but by the very nature of matter. It is not true that uncertainty, lack of control, decreases as accuracy goes up. It goes up as well. Jane Perrin offers as an example of this the measurement of the real density, the mass volume quotient, of a given quantity of air contained in a sphere. It varies noticeably when the volume of the sphere is reduced from 100 meters cubed to 1 centimeter cubed. There is very little variation when it is reduced from 1 centimeter cubed to 1 1,000th millimeter cubed, although already in this range, irregularly occurring variations of the order of a billionth can be observed. As the volume of the sphere decreases, the size of the variations increases. For a volume of one tenth of a cubic micron, the variations are of the order of a thousandth. And for one one hundredth of a cubic micron, they are of the order of one fifth. Further, decreasing the volume brings us to the molecular scale. If the sphere rule is located in the void between two molecules of air, the real density of the air in it is nil. But about one time in a thousand, the center of the sphere rule will fall within a molecule, and the average density is then comparable to what is called the real density of the gas. Reduced to intraatomic dimensions, chances are high that it will be located in the void once again with a density of zero. But one time in a million, its centre will fall within a corpuscle or in the nucleus of the atom, and when it does, the density will be several million times greater than that of water. If the spheral contracts so far further, the average density and the real density will probably soon become nil and remain nil, except in some very rare positions where it will reach values spectacularly higher than those obtained previously. Knowledge about the density of air thus resolves into a multiplicity of absolutely incompatible statements. They can only be made compatible if they are relativized in relation to a scale chosen by the speaker. In addition, on certain levels, statement of density cannot be made in the form of a simple assertion, but only as a modelized assertion of the type. It is plausible that the density will be equal to zero, but not out of the question that it will be of the order of 10 to the power of n, where n is a very large number. Here, the relation between the scientist's statement and what nature says seems to be organized as a game without perfect information. The modelization of the scientist's statement reflects the fact that the effective singular statement, the token, that nature will produce is unpredictable. The, all that can be calculated is the probability that the statement will say one thing rather than another. On the level of microphysics, better information, in other words, information with a higher performance capability, cannot be obtained. The problem is not to learn what the opponent nature is, but to identify the game it plays. Einstein balks at the idea that God plays with dice. Yet dice is precisely a game for which this kind of sufficient statistical regularities can be established, so much for the old image of the supreme determinant. If God played bridge, then the level of primary chance encountered by science could no longer be imputed to the indifference of the die toward which face is up, would have to be attributed to cunning, in other words, to a choice itself left up to chance between a number of possible pure strategies. It is generally accepted that nature is an indifferent, not deceptive opponent, and it is upon this basis that the distinction is made between the natural and the human sciences. 
In pragmatic terms, this means that the natural sciences, nature, is the referent, mute, but as predictable as a die thrown a great number of times, about which the scientists in exchange denotative utterances constitute moves that play against one another. In the human sciences, on the other hand, the referent man is a participant in the game, one that speaks and develops a strategy, a mixed strategy perhaps, to counter that of the scientist. Here, the kind of chance with which the scientist is confronted is not object-based or indifferent, but behavioural or strategic. In other words, agonistic. It will be argued that these problems concern microphysics and that they do not prevent the establishment of continuous functions, exact enough to form the basis of probabilistic predictions for the evolution of a given system. This is the reason in system theorists, who are also the theorists of legitimation by performance, used to try to regain their rights. There is, however, a current in contemporary mathematics that questions the very possibility of precise measurement, and this, thus the prediction of the behaviour of objects even on the human scale. Mandelbrot cites as a source of the text by a parent discussed above, but he extends the analysis in an unexpected direction. The functions with derivatives, he writes, are the simplest and easiest to work with. They are nevertheless exceptional. Using geometrical language, curves that have no tangent are the rule, and regular curves such as a circle are interesting but quite special. This observation is not just an object for idle curiosity, but it's valid for most experimental data. The contours of a flocule of soapy, salinated water present such irregularities that it is impossible for the eye to draw a tangent to any point on its surface. The applicable model here is that of Pronian motion, a well-known property of which is that the vector of the particle's movement from a given point is isotropic. In other words, all possible directions are equally probable but we've run into the same problem on more familiar levels as well. If, for example, we wish to make a precise measurement of the coast of Brittany, the crater-filled surface of the moon, the distribution of stellar matter, the frequency of bursts of interference during a telephone call, turbulence in general, the shape of clouds, in short, the majority of the objects whose outlines and distributions have not undergone regularization at the hands of man. Mandelbrot showed that data of this kind describes curves similar to those of continuous functions for which no derivative exists. A simplified model of this is Koch's curve. It is self-similar and it can be shown that the dimension of self-similarity in which it is constructed is not a whole number but log 4 divided by log 3. It would be justified to say of such a curve that it is located in a space whose number of dimensions is between 1 and 2, and thus that it lies intuitively somewhere between a line and a flat surface. Because the relevant dimension of cell similarity is a fraction, Mandelbrot calls objects of this kind fractals. The work of René Thom moves in a similar direction. He directly questions the validity of the notion of a stable system, which is a presumption in Laplace's determinism and even in probability theory. Then, Thom constructs a mathematical language allowing a formal description of the discontinuities that can occur in determined phenomena, causing them to take unexpected forms. The language constitutes what is known as catastrophe theory.